Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to... I almost said the wrong thing. Exploring the Lord of the Rings. That's where we are. It's Tuesday. I totally remember where I am and which broadcast I'm meant to be doing, so that is a good thing. Welcome to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. And indeed, not only is this Exploring the Lord of the Rings, but this is Exploring the Lord of the Rings that I've been looking forward to for a while, because tonight we are going to start Bilbo's poem. A. Arendel was a Mariner, one of my very favorite Tolkien poems. <coughs> And we're going to be discussing this, I think, for some little time. It's nine stanzas long. We're going to study it one stanza at a time. Uh, we'll see how long it takes us to get through the poem once. And then after we get through the poem once, I want to go back and I want to look at two uh, uh, two earlier drafts of this poem. Uh, because it's such a fast... This The growth of this poem is such a fascinating story. And such a really neat window into the whole development of Tolkien's thinking about things like elves and uh, and his mythology and uh, and Arendel and everything. So um, really, really fun. Uh, no idea how long we're going to be talking about this poem, but it's going to be great. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Um, yeah, Bruinier, we're totally going to go back and do Aaron Tree. Um, and then the intermediate version, which I think is so, so cool. Anyway, it's going to be awesome. We're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to, uh, uh, be here doing poetry for a while, I'm sure. Um, so, but there's another really exciting thing about this week, of course, uh, which is not only are we talking about Bilbo's greatest poem, but we are all, and this is also the first week of our fundraising campaign. So it is time. It is the fall fundraising campaign that began on Sunday on Hobbit Day, as we always do. And, uh, you know, the, the, and as you guys know, Signum University is a nonprofit. Uh, we are, you know, we are uh, uh, in fact uh, tax exempt. So all donations to Signum are, are, are tax deductible. But, um, you know, Signum is, uh, you know, we really rely upon the support of our uh, of our viewers, of our of our audience. Um, you know, we have accomplished what we've. You know, I during this past year, I talked about this a little bit on Sunday, but during this past year, you know, there have been a couple times, a couple occasions on which I have either stopped myself to reflect or kind of been compelled to stop and reflect, especially in the context of conversations I've had and testimonies I have given uh, at various legislative committees up at, uh, up at the state capitol buildings uh, in uh, Concord, New Hampshire, where I have spent a, a frankly uncomfortable amount of time over the last 12 months. Um, but one of the things which just often comes out here is that when people really begin, um, uh, uh, to, um, um, anyway, when people really begin to start, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of questioning me about how Signum grew and how it was developed, there's a lot of assumptions that people make about it from the beginning, right? Like, obviously we must uh, you know, have some kind of backer, right? We must have gotten some kind of grant or something like that. No, no, we didn't have any kind of grant. We had no kind of money at all. Um, uh, and then, of course, they're, they're sort of assuming, oh, well, you must just be kind of like somehow holding on until you can finally uh, apply for Title IV funding, meaning in America, uh, that where you can take advantage of the federal t uh, the federal money uh, from the student loan programs, right? So like once you can, once you can get, uh, once you qualify to get into the student loan programs, that's, that's, that's what you're shooting for, right? You just kind of, you're, you're, you're going small in the beginning and then looking to expand once you hit the federal loan programs. And I'm like, no, no, actually we're never going to use the student loan programs. We are starting off, uh, you know, Signum has begun in order to make a difference, uh, in the world. And we have been making a difference in the world and we've done it just thanks to you guys. Um, I do not know of any university that has started from scratch and grown up simply as a crowdfunded university in the way that Signum University has. And what we have accomplished together has been very, very remarkable. So, uh, anyway. We are always in need of, of your support, uh, and always very, very grateful for your support. And, uh, of course, I don't spend all year pestering you, uh, to remember to donate and asking you guys for money. Um, 
So that's why it's why the fall fundraising campaign exists. The fall fundraising campaign exists so that once a year, you know, in this one season a year, just for a few weeks, uh, I'll remind you about our needs at Signum University and the impact that you can have by donating to Signum University. And then the rest of the year, we can carry on talking about the Lord of the Rings and, uh, and, uh, and not having to worry about that because you guys have so generously, uh, supported and met our needs, uh, for the year. Exactly. This university was made possible through generous support from viewers like you. And unlike the institution uh, that coined that particular sentence, we don't receive federal funding. In addition, uh, it's made possible only through generous support of, of viewers like you. Um, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is, this is a, a really huge deal. So Signum University, our goal for our annual fund this year, in order to, to keep the lights on and continue moving forward, um, our, our annual fund goal this year is $70,000. Our goal was $60,000 last year and we raised like $71,000 last year. It was, it was, it was awesome. We, we were almost, uh, almost a, a, a 20% uh, overage last year beyond our needs, which was, such a blessing uh, to Signum. It's enabled us to uh, really begin this year in a totally different place than we've ever been before. <laughs> Namely, with money in the bank is <laughs> is the different place where we are. That's kind of an unusual thing. Uh, so anyway, that has been uh, a very, very remarkable uh, kind of development. Um, uh, so anyway, yes, De La Mancha, this, the annual fund is different from the funds for accreditation. That's a dedicated fund. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, but this is, just, we, we, this is the, the, these are the funds that we rely upon in order to, in order to keep operations going basically. Um, so, um, um, yeah, yeah, Matt, I know you understand, uh, how, how higher education works backstage, right? Uh, and so I know that, you know, people who, uh, who are familiar with that or familiar with higher education budgets and, 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 uh, the kind of demands and, and, uh, um, sort of standards that are demanded of higher education institutions. It's challenging. It's very challenging. And, uh, uh, anyway, we've been, um, We've been uh, 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 really, really blessed uh, by the generosity of our donors. So I wanted to remind you, it is time to donate again. So now, as you see, the next adventure uh, is the theme of our campaign this year, um, uh, shaping new paths to success. And and what I wanted to the, the sort of the promise implicit uh, in that title uh, is I'm going to be telling you guys about what's coming next for Signum University. What does chapter two of the Signum University story look like? Um, because it's, it's time. The time has come, uh, for us to grow, for us to, uh, uh, begin adding some new things on top of what we're doing. And I'm really, really excited about it. So I'm going to be sharing that at the state of the university address that I'm going to be giving in a couple of weeks. I'll show you the information on that later. And, uh, uh, JJ, I'm totally ignoring that reference, uh, uh, to the, uh, the, <laughs> to the Hobbit theme song <laughs> anyway, but yes, um, but, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, Simon says he feels guilty for admitting this, but if he paid even a semi fair price for all the free Signum and Mythgard content he's enjoyed and benefited from over the years, it might cover a quarter of the fundraising goal. Yeah, no, and, and again, you know, it's not about trying to guilt anybody into things, but I mean, this has always been, um, you know, there were a lot of people when I started off at, you know, at, uh, at, at, at Signum and stuff. And even just with my podcast who were like, you got to find ways to monetize this thing, right? You know, you got to find ways to, you know, people were sort of suggesting that we, you know, we find various, uh, kind of indirect ways to sort of slap a paywall down or something like that. And I'm like, you know what? No, that's never how I've wanted to operate. Never what I want to do. I'm just going to. Just gonna, I'm just going to give away as much as I possibly can for free all year round. And then once a year, just ask people to, uh, uh, to, to give what they can, uh, to give what they're willing to, to help it continue. You know, that's, um, that's, uh, that's our whole goal. But anyway, as I said, in the State of the Union address, I'm going to be talking about the next chapter. I'm going to be talking about the next, uh, uh, the, the, our next adventure at Signum University. Um, so we are, yeah, we're getting ready to move forward and it is, uh, it is pretty awesome. Um, so, uh, the, 
web address down here at the bottom, signumuniversity.org slash fund uh, is our um, uh, is our dominant. Uh, that's our, our primary page. Uh, let me... Um, let me show you when you click on that, this is what you see. So this is our fund page. And of course you can click straight through uh, on at this button here to our donation, to our online donation form, which is really simple. Uh, or of course you can go straight to our donate now page as well. Um, and uh, there's lots of information on this page. You can see some information about it. See, here's our new branch that we're throwing out here, uh, which I'll be talking about later on. Um, you can see this is the campaign event schedule. So there are going to be some cool things that are going on over the course of the campaign, um, including, as I said, the State of the University Address here at 8.30 p.m. on October 7th. So if you uh, click here, you can watch that on Twitch, or you can uh, join me in the NetMoot, uh, our go-to webinar session. Uh, and you should just click on this. It'll take you to the event page, and the registration link will be there. Or again, you can just show up um, uh, on Twitch as well for that evening. Uh, October 7th. So Monday, October 7th at 8.30 p.m. Um, other things, of course, I would draw your attention to on the upcoming events are the Lotro Marathon. This is a, a, a really fun event I look forward to every year when I do my big marathon. I'm going to be taking my, my primary character, uh, Wigand, who is in Minas Tirith now. Uh, I'm very proud of him. He's level 100 now. Uh, and we're going to... Um, um, and we're going to go, th I'm going to go through, uh, uh the, I'm going to finish the epic, uh, quest line there in Minas Tirith. And then I, I understand I'm, they're going to send me out. I've, I've heard rumors that during this marathon, I may get to see, to meet Han Han and the Wozes. Uh, and I, I'm going to get to see the ride of the Rohirrim. I don't think I'm going to be able to get all the way through the battle, uh, Pelinor Field, because I think there's still t probably too much stuff for me to do in one sitting. Um, but I think I'm going to be able to get all the way up to it, uh, basically. Yeah, you're right. I am going to have to bring lots of honey tea for my visit to the Wozes. If I have to say the name Han Han very often, I'm going to lose my voice pretty quickly. Um, but um, anyway... Yeah, so I, I I've never been to the to the to the forest of the Wozes. I've never, you know, I'm I'm really look. These are all things I've never done. Whenever I'm playing Wigand, you can know that these are quests and things that I've never done before because Wigand is my highest level character. Uh, so I'm going to be pushing him through all the way up to the battle if I possibly can, and who knows, maybe we'll do another event later on down the road for the battle. Of course, it's going to be the next big thing, right? Um, but um. Yes, exactly. Grifflet is the comparative completionist. Uh, uh, Wigand is kind of rushing through. So, um, uh, what was, oh yes. Anyway, so that's, that's certainly one event I would draw your attention to. Another is New England Moot. So we have two regional moots that are happening during the, f the fall fundraising campaign. New England Moot, which is this coming weekend, uh, 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 on the 20, the main event is on Sunday, the 29th of September. So that's this coming Sunday now. Um, and we're going to be, be meeting on the 28th as well. If you're registered for the event, you should have received an email uh, inviting you to this. We're going to be looking at some, uh, some, some, uh, we're going to be visiting some local literary uh, 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 sites in the area down there in Amherst, Massachusetts. We're going to be, uh, uh, in particular, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, doing some Emily Dickinson uh, sightseeing because she's from that area. Um, anyway, so that, that that's going to, so we're, we're going to, that, that's going to be fun. We're going to uh, do some hanging out in the afternoon. And I think we're going to do a special broadcast probably that afternoon on Twitch uh, as well. So those of you who are attending can join me for that. Uh, uh, and those of you who are not able to make it will still be able to join us there uh, uh, through Twitch uh, that afternoon. That's probably again, that's uh, still subject to um, final confirmation as to exactly when the time is uh, for that special broadcast. I'll try to uh, put out through social media some updates about that. Um, but uh, things are kind of spontaneous sometimes at regional moots. Uh, it's good to. Um, um, good to uh good to hang out together um so anyway um let's see the uh yes the emily dickinson museum that's it and the archives at the library for her and robert frost yeah really cool uh stuff down there absolutely um uh so the and of course we're also going to have middle moot 
on October 12th. Both of those moots you can still sign up for. Really great crowd showing up. We've got uh, uh, we've got a lot of people. New England moot is now already ranking in in attendance uh, uh, among our regional moots. We've got a lot of people coming, and it, and uh, I'm really excited seeing the list. I always I always ever since the very earliest days uh, when I used to set up and run everything myself at Signum University, I've always gotten notifications of all the registrations as they come in, email notifications and like things that pop up on my watch and my phone. Uh, and I love it. I still love it all the time. Uh, whenever anyone registers, I always see the notification and I'm like, oh, cool. She's coming. Oh, that's really neat. I can't wait to see her there. Uh, it's going to be really neat. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. If you can't come, of course, you know, don't worry if you're too far away from these regional moots. The point of the regional moots is that we're going to we're going to get around and we're going to hope to come as close to you as we possibly can uh, at various times. We're also adding some new moots uh, this year. The New England moot itself is a new moot. We haven't had anything up in the Northeast um, really ever, frankly, uh, despite the fact that I live here, which is ridiculous. Um, so that's going to be that's going to be new. We're going to we're we're looking into the possibilities of 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 a couple other new ones this year too. So um you know, and if you're interested in maybe hosting one near you, contact us. Send an email to info at signumu.org and we can talk about it and see what's see what's possible. Um all right. So, these are the things that are coming up. Oh, and just going back to the fun page here if you go down um, this is our donor appreciation program. If you, you know, when you donate to Signum University, we love to, to show our appreciation by giving you different gifts. Um, so you can see here through the list of all the different kind of, uh, the different gifts and ways in which we try to show you guys how much we appreciate, uh, your generosity. Speaking of generosity, I said that the, uh, the goal for our, for our annual fund uh, for this fiscal year. The fiscal year at Signum runs August 1st through July 31st uh, to match up with the academic calendar. And um, anyway, so our goal is $70,000. Um, thanks to the generosity of our recurring donors, those who have been faithfully giving uh, every month have set up monthly donations on our, on our donate, on our donate page. Um, we've through the, the, the pledges we've received from them for the coming year, we've already received gifts and pledges equaling up to $36,000 so far for this campaign. We're already just over halfway there uh, to our goal, but we still need 34,000 more dollars. Um, uh, for our annual fund this year. So I hope that you will consider, uh, donating. The monthly option is a really, uh, is a really nice one. People who, you know, if you can't afford to give very much, it's okay. If you give something like 10 bucks a month, you know, just a, a couple of lattes or something like that, uh, every month that really, uh, accumulates, uh, and is something that is, uh, uh, a really big blessing to Signum over the course of the year. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So no, things are, um, uh, uh, things are, things are really cool. And yeah, oh, that, that is one of my favorite rewards too. So, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, access to the lecture archives, uh, from the Signum catalog. Uh, yeah, that's a really, really fun one. Um, where you get you get to go through our entire every course we've ever offered uh well almost everyone that is the ones that have lectures right uh you can't get the lectures from one that hasn't had lectures uh and you um uh and you get to receive uh access to the lectures of any course you choose right yeah no it's 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 really cool um okay um so um <laughs> oh yeah, spiritual cushions. Yeah, no, we were given uh, we were given things away to see. I just do drawings, like I roll people's names, and then sometimes I accidentally give prizes to bots. Uh, anyway, so if you ever notice me giving a prize to it, just tell me because I don't always know. Um, yeah, that was funny the other day. Um, but um, cool. So yeah, so Zach, great question. If you already do a monthly donation, um, you can, uh, uh, you, you, you totally can, so y you have a couple options. If you already do a monthly donation and you would like to donate more, you can do one of two things. You can set up a second monthly donation, as you say, if you want to kind of spread it out so it doesn't, they don't all fall at the same place in the month, you can totally do that. Just have two separate monthly donations that'll come in on the different days uh, of the month. Um, or alternatively, you can just drop us an email and let us know, donate at at signumu.org, uh, just send us an email. You know, you can set up a new one, right? The, the 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 you know at the higher value that you want it to be, and then just let us know, and we can cancel the old one, and that's very easy. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, cool. Um, so anyway, I, I as I say, I uh, I hope that you will uh, that you will uh, join us in donating. Now, one last thing that I wanted to say about donations, um, and that is, we're, we're, I'm going to do again this year what I did last year. Um, you know, there's so many ways. I just I I always wanting to find more ways to sort of show how thankful I am to people who donate. So we're going to do um um we're going to do a. Uh, uh, a, a drawing like we did last year. So you remember last year, if you were around last year, you will remember, and I know that most of you here were, um, you will remember that we, we did an asynchronous drawing. So we're going to do a drawing during the campaign finale, which as you might have seen when I flashed past the schedule up here, uh, is on Oct uh, Saturday, October 19th. Um, but anyway, at the campaign finale, we're going to, we're going to do a drawing. Uh, we're going to do, do a drawing from all of the people who have made donations and who have mentioned Signum, uh, uh, the exploring the Lord of the Rings, right? So if, if you're a donor, which means if you've already donated this year since August 1st, or if you're, if you have a, an ongoing monthly donation already, uh, if you, that, if you do that, you already qualify. If you give a donation sometime in the next few weeks, of course, you can then accompany that with an email. Send an email to donate at signumu.org and just mention that you want to be entered into the Exploring the Lord of the Rings drawing. Okay. Uh, if you do that, again, that's all you have to do. Just send an email to donate at signumu.org to indicate that you would like to be part of that drawing. And I will draw three winners from that pool. And those three winners will get anytime audit. Uh, uh, you, you'll get, you'll get course access as we were just talking about, uh, to, uh, uh, to one of the lecture, uh, uh, archives, uh, from, uh, any course of your choosing. Uh, and the grand prize winner will also be able to have some, have, have a special exploring the Lord of the Rings class. You can join me, uh, for the field trip. We can do the field trip together. We can go and, and do some, uh, 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 field trip style archaeo gaming at the site of your choosing, uh, in Middle Earth. Um, as long as it's somewhere I can get to. <laughs> and, uh, and we can, or at least with sufficient accompaniment. Uh, and, uh, we, uh, or you can, you can name a topic. If there's some, if you want us to kind of take a break from the text and discuss something else, let's, I'd be happy to talk about that, right? So you get the, the opportunity. So the grand prize winner gets the opportunity to kind of be involved, uh, and guide one of our, uh, one of our sessions, uh, that way. So, um, anyway, yeah. So that's what's going to happen. So if you, again, if you, if you have made a donation this, uh, this year or, 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 or a continuing monthly donation that goes into this year. Or if you make a donation between now and then, send an email to donate at signumu.org and just mention that you want to be entered into the Exploring the Lord of the Rings drawing and we'll draw those winners, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, at the finale at the end. Okay. And yes, it is true. So, uh, I'm going to be doing these drawings for all of the different broadcasts that I do. Um, so, but you can only choose one. If you're a donor, you, you I don't want you, 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 you have to choose which, which drawing you want to be in, which means, of course, like, you know, you might want to think about the grand prizes, right? And which grand prize you value most, uh, in, uh, in the other broadcast. I'll be talking about the, uh, the prizes, uh, for the other broadcasts, uh, in those, um, uh, and those, uh, 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 broadcasts. So, oh, sorry, DMA, the then, the finale is when we'll be doing the drawing. Uh, and that is on the 19th of October. Saturday, October 19th will be the day of the finale, the traditional webathon finale. Then. Um, okay. Yep. Um, excellent. Okay. Any final questions about donations or about, uh, the, uh, campaign or upcoming events or anything like that. Again, it's always a, the fall campaign is always a very exciting time, uh, at Signum. Uh, and again, I want to draw your attention to the state of the university address on Monday, October 7th. Um, that's going to, that, that's going to be a big one. I'm going to be unfolding the vision, my vision for basically the next 10 years of Signum university. Um, we're almost 10 years old, not quite. We're eight years old, uh, this year. Um, but, uh, but we're really entering the next chapter of our existence this year. And, uh, I'm going to be talking about what's to come. So, um, 
uh, Mad Violinist, the State of the Universe, it will certainly be on YouTube. I'm not sh I don't think it'll be on the Tolkien Professor podcast feed, um, but it'll definitely be available in various places. Certainly, um, on, um, uh, certainly on our YouTube channel. Definitely. Um, and yes, Matt, if you have a monthly recurring donation, it does auto renew and it qualifies you at the level that you're donating. Yes, exactly. So, so say you were, uh, donating $25 a month, right? You're donating $25 a month, which is $300, uh, for the whole year, right? So then you would be, uh, you would be receiving the, uh, the, the gifts, right? For, uh, uh, for this level. And, uh, the $200 and up, this one was new last year, membership in the Signum Fellowship, which I've really, really enjoyed. We've been doing monthly meetings with the Signum Fellowship where I kind of give them a, uh, uh, just kind of sharing with them what's going on and some kind of insider stuff of what's happening behind the scenes at Signum and what we're planning. People in the Signum Fellowship already kind of know what I'm going to be talking about. Um, uh, in, uh, in a couple of weeks because they've heard me talk about it already a little bit. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, yes. So Matt, that's exactly how it works. You, if you, if, if you maintain it, you know, you are, um, we, we, we take your recurring, your continued recurring donation as, you know, a pledge at that level for the year and, and you receive the perks accordingly, uh, for that. Um, so yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, Mad Violinist, if, if we put it on the feed before, we'll probably do it again. Um, I don't do that now. So, uh, however it has been done is probably how it will be done. I'm thinking. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm not really, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not in charge of that anymore. Uh, so, uh, yes, yes. Um, cool. All right. Um, Excellent. Excellent. Oh, yes. Sorry. Uh, on the Twitch chat, Epic Uger, I see uh, yeah, your lore question. Yes, that's true. I usually don't have time because I am I have a hard enough time getting through one or two paragraphs of The Lord of the Rings uh, as we work our, our methodical way through the text. Methodical, I suppose, is one word for it. Um, but I do answer, like, random lore questions. Love to answer random lore questions. The time I normally do that is in my Grifflet stream on Friday afternoons on the Lotro official uh, Twitch channel um, is when I do most of my just taking lots of random lore questions from the crowd. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Okay. Very good. So thank you. And thank you in advance for uh, everyone who 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 is has been donating, has monthly donations set up. As, you know, for those of you who are thinking of setting up monthly donations or, or are going to be giving over the next couple of weeks, thank you guys for everything that you do. Don't remember, don't, don't remember. Don't forget, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to make your donation here during the campaign. And then we can be, we can be celebrating it as we move forward. And I'll give you some updates on where things are and stuff like that. So, uh, we're, um, uh, we're, we're doing, uh, uh, we're, we, I just, I, I just love this time of year, uh, thanking everybody for all the work that they're doing. And now it is time for poetry. So actually, wait, it's almost time for poetry. One question I wanted to, or comment really that I wanted to draw attention to this was Kate Neville, uh, which was a really great uh, comment that she posted. She said, something new that struck me on this reading was the nature of the friendship between Bilbo and Aragorn. Bilbo is comfortable enough with Aragorn to tease him about standing up Arwen at the feast. He tells Frodo he gets more Shire news from the Dúnedain than from Gandalf. We also learn later that Bilbo is the one who composed the All, is Gold, All That Is Gold poem, which even Gandalf uses as an identity check in his letter. Bilbo says that he is often called that here in Rivendell. That is, he's often called the Dúnedain here in Rivendell. But it is certainly a soubriquet that Bilbo has enthusiastically adopted. Is it a form of teasing? Does Aragorn call him halfling? And exactly how well do they know each other? Um, I had to skip one bit where Kate was pointing out that the word Dunedon does not actually occur very often in The Lord of the Rings. Uh, and uh, Bilbo is the only one to use it multiple times. Bilbo uses it six times. Um, and there's no record of anybody else calling him Dunedon, except for Glorfindel, 
when he's actually speaking Elvish, right? Um, he calls it that when, so that's included in the first Elvish remarks that he makes as he's, you know, running down the hill towards them. Um, uh, or sorry, as Aragorn is running down the hill towards him, uh, right? He calls out to him and does refer to him as Dunedon, but it's not really obvious that anybody else really calls him this all the time, right? Uh, but Bill is certainly not in the way that Bilbo seems to do. I thought that was a really interesting point. Anyway, she goes on. According to the tale of years, Gandalf first confines his doubts to Aragorn in 3001, soon after the birthday party. But by year 3000, the Shire was already being closely guarded by rangers. Bilbo settles in Rivendell in 3002, and while Aragorn is helping Gandalf off and on for the ensuing years, he certainly used Rivendell as his home base, especially after Arwen returned in 3009. That's 16 years, with both living in Rivendell, with Aragorn gone for long periods of time. I don't like to think that Gandalf would ask Aragorn to cultivate a friendship, but I am sure that Aragorn would think it important to know as much as he could about this former ring-bearer, especially as Bilbo did what Isildur could not do. I love that final comment. Moreover, and this is something I have I so much wanted to see in the Hobbit film, when Bilbo first stayed in Rivendell, he would certainly have noticed a ten-year-old human boy. According to Karen Wynne Fonstead's calculations, he, Bilbo, was there for about three weeks, which in my head canon is certainly enough time to strike up a friendship with someone his own size, a la Pippin and Burgill. Picture Bilbo entertaining Estelle with the story of the trolls. What a lovely surprise to discover that boy's true identity sixty years later, after which I can well imagine Bilbo taking a proprietary interest in all things Estelle Aragorn Dunedon. Um, really, um, uh, really excellent, uh, comment by Kate, of course, uh, as, uh, uh, as is almost always the case. Um, but just some, some really good stuff here. I do agree. I do think that this, um, uh, th there is evidence, uh, of a really close friendship between the two of them. I loved that comment, as I mentioned in passing about, um, Aragorn's probable interest in Bilbo. Right, because Bilbo did what is, especially since Bilbo did what Isildur could not do. I agree, you have to think that that really piqued Aragorn's interest, right? Aragorn would have known the story. Uh, not that many people know this story. Aragorn probably is one of them who knew this story. Um, and, uh, and he would certainly have been interested, uh, to meet Bilbo, especially if he had met, met him before. Right. He would know from Gandalf that this was, um, an important thing, you know, as far as, uh, the war against Sauron and everything. Um, but yes, uh, Sam Florian, I agree. It does seem likely that Aragorn and Bilbo would be the only non elves in Rivendell most of the time. Uh, Kurtzimus, I can't really count Elrond in that, uh, in, the, in that list. I mean, technically, yeah, but he's, uh, He's, he, he totally, he totally, uh, uh, stood up to be counted on the elf side there. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I really, um, it is, we don't have very much direct evidence, but I certainly agree with K in my own head canon as well. You know, I, 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 I have to imagine based on the evidence that we have here of the, um, the, the casualness, right? Um, the, uh, the, the, the easiness of their friendship that they have known each other for a while. They're not just acquaintances, right? Bilbo and Aragorn are really friends. Um, and it is certainly easy to imagine them meeting when, when Estelle was a kid and Bilbo came through there, right? Um, and, uh, and yeah, Gilgantha, I agree. There, um, there doubtless are others who visit Rivendell at times, uh, dwarves and, men, maybe other Dunedain come through, but, but yeah, as far as like regular residents, um, I have to think there aren't that many. And again, this even, I think we see evidence for this, for, for a friendship on that basis, even in the fact that Bilbo really wants Aragorn's help with his poem, right? He doesn't ask an elf. He's clearly friends with many of the elves, but he doesn't ask the elf, uh, any elf for help or even just to listen through it for him and give him some feedback, you might think that would be even more appropriate, right? That he, Bilbo, 
would want to be like, okay, um, before I sing this in front of Elrond, could I, um, can I get an elf point of view? Uh, you know, you know, you've known Elrond for millennia. How do you think he's going to take this poem, right? I mean, you'd think that he might want to do, but that's not what he does. In fact, he does something almost the opposite of that, right? Um, which is to seek out like his only other non-elf friend <laughs> from Rivendell. Uh, and there is that sense. I mean, I, 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 I do agree. I think that, um, uh, we can see this sort of, you know, we mortals need to stick together, right? Kind of element there um, in uh, in that particular camaraderie and that particular action. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's really, I think that that's really cool. Um, and Mike, I think you're right. I mean, I, you know, Mike is saying that he imagines Aragorn in Strider mode doesn't really make many friends. So this is rare at this time in his life. Yeah, I mean, he's chosen to distance himself, right? I mean, doubtless he has friends among the Dunedain, right? We know this, right? We, we we will see this when he meets Halberd, but even though he is involved with many of the other Dunedain and he is their captain, you know, and he is, um, uh, but like, he doesn't hang out with them, right? It, it's, it's, does he joke around with many of them, right? Do they give him nicknames? You know, I, I, I don't know. Like if he has that kind of friend, like just that kind of, of, um, um, that kind of intimacy with them, exactly. Um, but, um, yeah, Katriana, I don't know of any evidence that Tolkien was intending to include a meeting between Bilbo and Aragorn when he was going to rewrite The Hobbit to sync it with The Lord of the Rings. He got nowhere near that. I mean, he did get them to Rivendell. Um, it's possible, of course, because, you know, one of the elements, this was in 1960, so it was after, well after the publication of the Lord of the, Lord of the Rings, that he wanted to rewrite The Hobbit. Um, you know, the two primary things that we see him doing in the first few chapters when he's rewriting it, um, in the, you know, the draft of those first two sort of soulless and not very funny chapters of The Hobbit, of The Rewritten Hobbit, are reconciling the style, trying to write it in the style of The Lord of the Rings instead of the the comical juvenile style of The Hobbit, and secondly, um, of his wanting to reconcile it to the geography, like the topography. He worked out what the world looks like so much more, including like the rivers and, and, and the way the road goes and everything. And so he wanted to introduce more of that, you know, to make it feel like he, you know, Bilbo and Frodo are really, you know, walking the same path as they go, uh, towards Rivendell. I mean, you know, mostly not exactly the same, but anyway, um, those are the two primary things that you see in the first couple chapters of his, of his trying to make the change. So we don't really get to a point where plot elements like that, like obviously there's a good reason why Estel is not there in Rivendell in the Hobbit. And that's because of course the character of Aragorn was not invented until long, long, long after that book was written. So that's a very good reason for him not to be there. And so Catriona, we can imagine, would he have made that call? Right. Especially when Bilbo comes back, spends a little more time at Rivendell right on the way home. Um, would he have even just had a cameo? Right. Uh, made reference to this 10 year old kid, maybe have a have a you know, a, to indulge oneself in imagining uh, as Kate is suggesting a scene. Right. Uh, of meeting um, there. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, Matt, that's another really interesting way to think about this. Matt says Bilbo is the only one who is not owed something or owes something to Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings. It's a unique relationship in that regard. Yeah, he he's not one of his subjects, right? So he's he doesn't he, to Bilbo. Aragorn is not a captain, right? He is not a chieftain. He is not a future king. Um, he can have a kind of unofficial. Um, uh, uh, relationship with him, right? Uh, he can be kind of friends with him. I don't know, like off the books, right? And, uh, and, you know, and the other way around, right? Like, uh, you know, Elrond and Gandalf have different relationships with Aragorn, right? They're in like a senior position and Elrond's relationship is all kinds of awkward, right? Potential father-in-law too. So, whoo. Um, but, um, 
uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, so I, I, I do think that, um, you can see that the whole grounds of their relationship, uh, is quite different than, um, uh, than we see for most, uh, for most people. Um, yeah, good. <laughs> Bilbo could have been his poet laureate. Yeah, eventually, right? Eventually. I don't think he would have wanted the position by the time it actually would have come open, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, okay. So anyway, so thank you, Kate, for that, uh, for that comment. And now, the poem. So the first thing we will do, uh, is pay attention to the shape of this, because one of the things that makes this poem so remarkable is it is one of the most intricate verse forms that Tolkien ever wrote in. Um, Tolkien loved manipulating the sound of words. He loves meter and playing with different meters with different, with different rhythmic forms. He loves line length and stanza form, again, sort of playing with the way that that affects not just the rhythm of the words from syllable to syllable, but the flow of the lines, right? And the interaction between both of those things, both the flow, the, the rhythm of the syllables and the flow of the lines, the way that those things interact with the content, right? With the actual, uh, sentences and ideas of the poem. But of course, he also loved to play with the sound of the words. That is the, um, the, um, Things like rhyme and assonance and alliteration. Rhyme and alliteration are really two of his very favorite things. Um, the structure of this poem, as I said, is, is as intricate as anything he ever, uh, attempted in his life. In the earlier versions of this poem that we're going to look at, you will both see and hear that the form is much more prominent in those earlier versions. Um, this poem has exactly the same form, but one of the things that makes it, and this is one of the reasons why, for this reason alone, I was tempted to actually start with the earlier versions and then work up to this poem instead of starting with it and working backwards. Um, but I just, I wanted I decided we really needed to start with this poem in order to get it, to, to get it in the context of the prose, right? That's been building up to it. Um, so just in this, in the, in the desire of continuing the story, I wanted to make sure that we started here, but there's a really interesting effect and, and, and we'll see if we can, uh, you know, I'll try to draw attention to it when we look at the earlier versions. The first time Tolkien wrote this form, the first version of this poem, it's like crazy. It's like, it's a joke. I was about to say it's like a joke. It's not like a joke. It is a joke. Like it's designed to be funny. Um, because, uh, the, 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 the rhyme scheme itself has an actively comical, uh, effect. By the time he gets to this version of it, he's using the same form, but he does something just like head and shoulders more difficult, right? It's really hard to maintain a super intricate rhyme scheme for dozens and dozens and dozens of lines, right? It is even harder to maintain that intricate rhyme scheme, but have that be sort of blended in so fluidly that the reader can forget about it, right? It just sort of becomes part of the shape and the, uh, and the, the kind of the sound pattern of the poem. And you can read through lines and lines and not even notice that this, that this particular rhyme structure is there. And that is amazing when he's able to do that. Um, so let me just read the first, uh, the first stanza. I know a lot of you are familiar with this poem, but of course I'm going to go through and, and, uh, talk about the, uh, the shape of it, um, <clears throat> which I know is familiar to, to many of you, but I know it won't be to all. So I, I want to make sure to do it. Okay. A Arendel was a mariner that tarried in Arvernian. He built a boat of timber felled in Nimbrathel to journey in. Her sails he wove of silver fair, of silver were her lanterns made. Her prow he fashioned like a swan, and light upon her banners laid. Okay, so what's the, so first of all, what's the rhythm? What is the basic rhythm of the, uh, of the poem? What's the meter? And this is not even 
this you can guess, right? Even just without listening to it, right? Um, yes, the one with the emphasis on the even beats. It is iambic. Arenda was a mariner that tarried in Arvernian. He built a boat of timber felled. That's a perfect one. He built a boat of timber felled in Nimbrathil to journey in. Right? Iambic? Exactly, Rinruz. It's Hobbit meter. Iambic tetrameter. As we've seen before, though it's been so long since we've talked about other poems you may have forgotten, Iambic tetrameter has been throughout Hobbit meter. Oh, I've been calling it the vast majority of Hobbit poetry that we have read has been an iambic tetrameter. Um, four beats per line, that means, right? So it means the basic rhythm is bump, 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 and there are four bumps per line, right? Um, now, the, and that's pretty regular, right? All the way through. Arendel was a mariner that tarried in Arvernian. He built a boat of timber felled in Imbrathil to journey in. Her sails he wove of silver fair. Of silver were her lanterns made. Her prow he fashioned like a swan and light upon her banners laid. Not quite exactly perfectly regular all the way through, but pretty darn close, right? So it's designed to be very chant-like, right? Very regular a very kind of soothing beat. Notice also that it has pauses built in the end and right at the ends of many of the, uh, of many of the lines, right? Um, and there are no breaks in the middle of the line, in the middle of the lines. Uh, that is to say, like, notice that there's no like periods or semicolons that break up a line in the middle of the line and every period or semicolon that there is is at the end of the line and most of the commas, right? There's very little enjambment, at least in this early one, you know, and uh, enjammed lines are ones which just kind of flow right over into the next one, right? You kind of pause at the end of almost all of these lines. A Arendel was a mariner that tarried in Arvernian. He built a boat of Timberfeld in Nimbrathel to journey in. Her sails he wove of silver fair, of silver were her lanterns made. Her prow he fashioned like a swan, and light upon her banners laid. See the syntactic shape of those lines? Notice that we get basically an in one independent clause each in the first two lines, right? So two lines each for per independent clause, right? Arendel was a mariner that tarried in Arvernian, independent clause, right? He built a boat of Timberfeld in Nimbrathel to journey in. Independent clause. Now we mix it up a little bit. In the next four lines, right, those all hang together. So we get two pairs of, of, of two lines, and then we get the quatrain. Her sails he wove of silver fair, of silver were her lanterns made, her prow he fashioned like a swan, and light upon her banners laid. That's like a series of four actions, right? What did he, how did he make the sails? Uh, what were the lanterns made of? What did a prow look like? And what was laid upon the banners, right? That's, uh, that those are the, you know, so those four things are, are described. So again, notice how, how neatly things fit. Um, it, this is not a, uh, uh, as I say, there's, the, there's not a lot of enjambment. In some verse, you know, we're kind of, pulled along through many lines and it's kind of breathless or that is actually literally breathless to read out loud. Not the case here. Um, it's very, uh, uh, sort of self-contained, right? Um, now look at the rhyme pattern. When we look at rhyme patterns, of course, the first thing we normally do, the things that like most rhyming poetry has trained us to do, uh, is to look at the ends of lines, right? Um, and what do we see? Well, we see Arvernian and Jernian. We see made and laid. Okay. So we have clearly an end line, an end rhyme, I mean, at the end of the line, right? On the even line. So two and four rhyme and six and eight rhyme, right? Uh, exactly. So that's the basic. And, but, but no, notice what you heard when I did two and four, right? It's cooler than just having a rhyming syllable at the end of the even in, in couplets, two, four, six, eight, right? Some at least of those rhymes are polysyllabic rhymes. Um, Arvernian and Jernian rhyme, right? That's those, those are trisyllabic rhymes, 
there. Arvernian Journeyan. Um, so that's pretty cool. Lanterns made and banners laid is not so close as Arvernian and Journeyan, right? But you can still hear, although made and laid are the clear rhyming lines, lanterns and banners, it's, there, there, there's a lot of similarity there, right? We've got the, 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 the same vowel, right? And you've got the, the same vowel with the N in the middle, right? And the S at the end. Um, so it's, it's not exactly the same rhyme. Um, it's, it's more kind of forgiving for, uh, than that. Remember, this is what I was talking about when I said that he can do a really intricate rhyme scheme and you don't even really fully notice it, right? You might process that last syllable, but when you're reading it through, you might not even notice that there was a trisyllable rhyme there the first time. And the second, trisyllable rhyme or trisyllable assonance, right, would probably go past you, right? That's what he's, so he's not, he's not failing to rhyme it well. He's making that deliberate choice to pull back from really neat rhymes. Um, because really neat polysyllabic rhymes in English are often comical. The, the result is often comical. Um, can I think of other poems with trisyllabic rhyme schemes? Yes, but they're not appropriate. Um, sorry, uh, I've been spending the last several months immersing myself in the history of American rap music. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, a great deal of Eminem's corpus uh, is full of trisyllabic rhymes. He's really good at those. Uh, even pentasyllabic rhymes, if you can believe it. Um, but um, uh, but anyway, yeah, the... Um, uh, the uh, Dr. Seuss, of course, is the place to go for all kinds of rhymes. Dr. Seuss actually did not do multisyllabic rhymes very often, um, but uh, uh, but sometimes he did. He was Dr. Seuss's strength is really in metrical evenness, and that's why um, Brick Tales, when you talk about being too neat, would be like Dr. Seuss. Um, Dr. Seuss is what his sense of rhythm is so good. He is so excellent at writing meters. Um, that, um, uh, he's so excellent at, at writing meters that any time a poet or a songwriter, right, especially a rapper, actually rappers will, will, uh, diss each other using that. They'll say that your, your, your rhymes sound like Dr. Seuss. Um, they've been doing that since the early nineties. Um, uh, but anyway, the, the, the reason is that if your, if your rhythm becomes too simple and too regular, it reminds everybody of Dr. Seuss because he's so good at like getting in your ear that way. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I actually used to use Dr. Seuss all the time. Whenever I was teaching poetic meter, I always use Dr. Seuss. My English classes constantly. Uh, I mean, it is by far the best way because you can illustrate all of the basic poetic meters, uh, with Dr. Seuss, uh, and even ways in which he shifts and manipulates them. So good. So good. Oh man. Dr. Seuss is absolutely a metrical genius. Um, not again, he doesn't, he doesn't play with the meter that much. Sometimes he does, right? Like the wonderful moment at the end of the Lorax when he shifts from his classic anapestic meter to a dactylic meter. Um, uh, plant a new truffle, treat it with care, feed it fresh water or give it clean water and feed it fresh air. Right. Um, uh, he, th th that shift in meter from Anapest to Dactyl in that moment gives the, you know, that, that, that final injunction, you know, to the reader at the end of the Lorax, this, this, this amazing kind of urgency right before in the last line, it slips back into Anapest. So good. So good. Anyway, but, uh, that's not important right now. Um, the, <laughs> the important thing is, uh, that, uh, the, the trisyllable rhymes. That's what we were talking about. Okay. So we've got trisyllable rhymes or at least trisyllable assonance, uh, near rhymes, right? Um, at the end of every other line. But wait, there's more. What else happened? That's not the only rhymes that we get. Again, we're trained to look at the ends of lines and the odd number lines don't seem to fit. Mariner, Timberfeld, Silver Fair, Like a Swan. Those don't, those don't fit, right? What else is there? Yes, the internal rhyme. The internal rhyme. So in addition to the end rhymes in two and four, and then again in six and eight, we get the internal rhymes at the end of line one and the beginning of line two. 
butted up right against each other. Mariner that tarried in. Timberfeld in Nimbrathel. Of silver fair, of silver were, like a swan and light upon. So another Try syllable, but again, these are these are deliberately slant rhymes, so it doesn't sound comical because this is not a comical poem, right? This is a poem about Elrond's dad, and that is a very serious subject. Even if you're not in Rivendell, but if you and you are in Rivendell, it's a super serious subject, and you don't want to sound like you're making jokes about it, right? Um, but, uh, but that's it. But that's a feature. So we have two sets in every quatrain. And every four lines, we have three sets of trisyllable assonances and rhymes, right? The end of line one, beginning of line two, end of line three, beginning of line four, and end of line two and end of line four. So it's all connected together. So we get three trisyllable rhyming sets in every four lines of the entire poem. And that's what makes the whole thing Connecting it. So yeah, no, by all means, Fourth Dauntless. And if, if I use like English teacher terminology, uh, when I'm talking about poetry that you don't get, please don't be shy about telling me. I, I don't want to take that for granted and I try not to do it more than I have to, but, uh, but sometimes I do. So yes, slant rhyme just means two words that like almost rhyme, but don't like banners and lanterns is a slant rhyme, right? That just means like they, they don't exactly rhyme. Um, again, Arvernian, Journeyan, that, that's just a straight up three syllable rhyme, right? Lanterns, banners don't exactly rhyme, but they, but they come really close. Again, they share a lot of the same sounds. They share a lot of the same rhythms. We can see both, both, uh, especially the vowels, but also many of the consonants that they share together. So again, it's not quite exactly a rhyme, but it's, um, but it's close to a rhyme. Good. Yes, there are, um, uh, there are alliterative moments in this as well. Built a boat, right? Is good. Um, we do get, uh, Mornelman is saying there are a lot of like, uh, B's and L's here. Yeah. We do get a lot of things like, um, light upon her banners laid. Right, built a boat of timber felled in Nimbrathil to journey in. Her sails he wove of silver fair, of silver were her lanterns made. Her prow he fashioned like a swan, and light upon her banners laid. You can get um, get a a kind of a a flavor, right? For like, there's like a, sort of trends among among some consonants here that come up, like the S's, right? Three times, not quite in a row, but in close proximity there um the uh the 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 built a boat and the lanterns and then the light and banners and laid at the end so we get the way that the l's and the b's all kind of come together there um this is uh, this is definitely something that he um was sort of playing with and, I, and again it's what i love about this poem more than anything else about this poem we see him in this poem being more purely playful with language than I think we see anywhere else. Now, the playfulness, uh, the whimsicality of it, much stronger in the earlier versions. Um, what we're seeing here is the mature version in a couple different ways. Mature in the sense that he's been revising this now for decades already by this time. Um, and so he has been developing those, these sound patterns and rhyme structures and things and, and getting it to a the place where he wants it to be, which is again, no longer designed to make people laugh as it was originally, but is instead designed to give this really rich tapestry of sound to a really serious, I hate using the word epic in a vague way, but I will, a very epic poem, right? Um, a very epic subject matter. Um, but I, I, but again, but I also mean matured in the sense that it has, it's, again, it's not just a joke anymore, which the original poem really was a joke. Um, and JJ, I like the whimsical versions too, don't get me wrong. Um, but it's like knowing and liking the, the whimsical versions, uh, makes me admire this poem, like how he st stayed in so many ways true to that while doing something totally 
different with it, right? I mean, it, it, it's like this. Imagine a composer who writes a really, really f- like fun, like somebody who's doing um uh who's doing a a, a, a soundtrack, right? A movie soundtrack, and writes a really comical line of music, right? It just it's really whimsical and it's funny and, and it happens in a funny scene and it really just like helps to encourage you to laugh and conveys to you really clearly how lighthearted and funny that whole scene is. And, and it, but it's like really, it's, it's, it's really intricate and complicated, right? But it's, it's, it's very complexity, which makes it so comical, right? Then imagine taking that same, uh, that same theme, right? With the same complexity and making it, changing it into like the sweeping epic, like moving, you know, like tears rolling down your face because of the sheer beauty of it. Uh, but it's the same theme, right? Just kind of altered and, and, uh, uh, and shifted. And I mean, it's kind of amazing. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Rayburns, you're right. Um, the original errantry poem is kind of like, uh, the, the kind of thing I'm describing, the Cantina song in Star Wars is a really good example uh, of that. Kind. It's not very complicated, but as far as like the sort of the spirit and, and, and the comedy of the thing. But see, imagine if that same melody, right, of the Cantina song, you know, is made into like, well, maybe not the Imperial March, but into like the triumphant music at the end of the film. Right. I mean, that would be amazing. Um Mad Violinist, I do agree that Howard Shore comes close to that with the Hobbit, with the Hobbit-like motif. Um, there are a lot of things. I mean, I, it's one of the reasons I made the the soundtrack comparison because we can see that kind of thing happening sometimes in soundtracks where a theme like that is adapted and developed in this new, uh, in this new way. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Anyway, uh, I've been focusing on the shape of this. Uh, but we haven't talked about the content yet. So what's this about? What does it say? Notice in the first two sentences, or rather, sorry, the first two lines, the first independent clause, right? We're identifying A. Arendel. Who's this A. Arendel guy? We're told two things about him. He was a mariner that tarried in Arvernian. That's interesting. Okay, he tarried in this place. So this isn't where he's from, right? Like, it seems like the opening gesture here, uh, you know, to identify A. Arendel is to tell us who is he, what's his name, what's his job, and where's he from, right? Um, but it doesn't tell us where he's from. It tells us that he tarried there. Tarry is a really interesting word in that context, right? When you're tarrying somewhere, it means you're staying there. It certainly does not suggest long-term residency, right? But more, it almost sounds like he was, uh, yes, remained longer than needed, like you're waiting for something. Exactly. Yeah, he. it it does sound like overstaying your welcome, almost like dilly-dallying, right? Yeah, exactly. So he's from Arvernian, but he shouldn't have been, right? Or at least he stayed there over long. We don't know that it's necessarily pejorative, it's necessarily a criticism of him that he tarried there, but it certainly conveys the idea, and really powerfully in one word, that he's not from... That's not his place, right? In as much as he spent time there, he was just tarrying. From the beginning, from literally the opening lines, A. Arendel is homeless, right? He doesn't have a place. He's going to have a mighty doom later on, right? And that mighty doom is going to be living on the move, right? He's never going to have a place, but we see that that's part of his identity from the very beginning. And Rayburn's, it does imply, again, based on what we're told in these first two lines, his only, his home ultimately is the sea. Yeah. Yeah. He was a mariner that tarried in Arvernian. Like that was a port that he sometimes hung out in. But his identity, he's a mariner. So yeah, his home is the sea. His home is his ship, really. 
Um, and that's the sort of the context. So yeah. And so Simon, you're right. Uh, the poem about A. Arendel is getting cheeky from the first couple sentences, right? Let's, um, let's cause, cause yeah. Who, um, who lived in Arvernian where A. Arendel tarried occasionally his kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, exactly. Brandon Elrond and Elros only exist because he, t because of his tarrying. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, maybe, um, uh, maybe a little reminder that, uh, dad was never around <laughs> is, uh, is, is kind of a, it's kind of a heavy way to begin the poem. You, 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 you gotta think, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. He built a boat of timber felled in Nimbrathil to journey in. Where is Nimbrathil? Answer. We have no idea. Where's Arvernian? No clue. Right? No idea. And don't look at the Silmarillion map. Don't, don't, I'm saying we, we don't know. Right. Remember, these are just names. First edition. Right. We're reading this book for the first time. We have no idea what these names are. And that's not. That doesn't matter. Right. That's not actually important. <laughs> right. The Empress Aureliana says, I was just Googling the names. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, they're real names and stuff, but that's but it's not what matters in the context of this poem. Right. But it's interesting, never, despite the fact that we are being given proper nouns, that we have absolutely nothing to attach to them. Right. Um, nothing at all. Yet we're given two of them in the first four lines. Right. And so we are being told he is from this, you know, he's associated with these places, right? Legendary places, I guess, presumably. It's timber felled in Nimbrathil. Okay. Right. So special timber, I'm thinking. Right. I don't know what's special about it, but I think it's, um, but okay. I've, I've, I've gotten that, right? Um, it does give the poem's place an air of mystery, or at least a desire for us to want to know more, uh, about it. Um, and, um, uh, uh, mad violinist. Yeah. They, they are kind of te textual ruins is an interesting way to think about them, right? I mean, these are just the remnants of, of legends that we anyway, as listeners to this poem, certainly don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, they are like fairy tale places. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, we don't, um, we don't know. Uh, yeah, Ambrosius asks, uh, is it fair to assume he created these names primarily for how they fit into the rhyme and the, and the rhythm scheme? Well, I mean, they do, right? Um, so I, you know, he invented these names, or rather he, he, he invented these names and not different names because they fit the rhyme scheme. But it's not like he does this all the time. I mean, this is a long poem. Three trisyllabic rhymes per quatrain for every four lines, right? We're going to get something like what? Um, I mean, this line, I, I, I forget how many lines this poem has. Something More than 120, however, right? Which means we're looking at 90 sets of trisyllabic rhymes. Relatively few of those are going to be based on made-up proper nouns, right? So it's not like he's just like using this to bolster the effect purely, right? And of course, they are in his, um, they are in his invented languages, right? So it's not like they're random combinations of sounds. Um Unlike in Errantry, as we'll see, there he did use much more silly names, uh, which often lent themselves greatly to the comical effect of the lines of, and especially of that rhyme scheme. Um, but these aren't, these aren't comical. Um, 
instead they do provide that air of mystery, that air of sort of fairy otherness. Uh, it's almost like we should know. He built a boat of timber felled in Nimbrathel to journey in. Again, I, I certainly the effect that has on me is like, oh, that's like super special timber. I don't know what's special about it, but I'm going to nod because like, yeah, timber of Nimbrathel, absolutely. Um, her sails he wove of silver fair, of silver were her lanterns made. Her prow he fashioned like a swan and light upon her banners laid. The ship is beautiful. Woven of silver, her sails are. Made with, with, with lanterns, hung with lanterns of silver. Her prow fashioned like a swan. Trying to remember. I don't think we have any context for that. Swan boats, I mean. I think this is our first swan boat. Again, if we're Lord of the Rings readers, this is our first swan boat, right? Now, if we are Silmarillion readers, which means, like, if we're C.S. Lewis, then, uh, then we will recognize the swan boats, right? Um, but we don't yet have any reference for the swan boats. Um, it does sound really beautiful. Um, and Mad Violinist, I agree. It's, uh, like full, uh, full, going full epic for the ship design. Absolutely. Um, now, that last line, I'm not sure how to interpret that last line. A couple of you have been asking questions about that. And I think that there are, there are a couple, um, there are a couple different ways I think that we can read that line. And light upon her banners laid. Probably that means light is shining on her banners. Maybe it means, ooh, that's a good, I wasn't even thinking of that, Meli Owen, um, that it's, uh, maybe it's like cloth of gold, right? So like her banners are made to shine. And so in that sense, light is being laid on them. Um, it is also possible that like the actual like sigil on the banner uh like his his symbol on the banner um is light or something radiant and shining um yeah so he is it does yeah iwendillian the actual syntax of the line says that he is laying light upon the banners either that means again it could mean that light is his symbol and so that is being represented upon the banners, right? Or uh, it's actual light that is shining on the banners, like the like what lanterns are being placed above the banners so that you can see them. That seems a little bit lame, but um, but I certainly agree. I, I went Dillian, It's all been his actions so far. He wove her sails. Um, uh, he fashioned. Her prow, he laid light upon her banners. Yeah. Um, uh, yep. Yeah. Um, the idea of his, of his, his symbol, right? His, um, like the sigil on his banners being, uh, being light, being a light in some way, uh, maybe a starburst or something like that. Um, exactly, Tim Dolph, the light of a Silmarillo upon the banners, possibly. Uh, not like literally the light of the, like, the, I don't think that would mean they'd be radiant with the light of a Silmaril, uh, cause he's leaving the Silmaril back home where he tarries, I guess, but as we'll learn. Um, but that, that's what's visually represented upon the banners. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing at Arden Crayon's little poem. <laughs> Corey Olson was a professor who tarried in a Discord chat. He built a class of Tolkien fans and brought them there to lecture at. <laughs> I really like to lecture at. Uh, that's good. That's very good. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, yeah, Matt says, given that there will be an important banner that will flash in the dawn much later in the book, it is significant. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, 
the association between light and the banners. Um, that, I mean, we know, well, we know who read the book many times, what his Arendel's destiny is going to be and his association with light. Um, maybe the line only does mean that his banners are illuminated, right? That light is, 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 is shone upon his banners to make them, uh, uh, to make them shine and, 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 you know, all snappy and visible. Um, but in any case, even if that's the case, it's certainly a foreshadowing, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, let's read the second stanza. Are you ready for this? They get longer. In panoply of ancient kings in chained rings he armored him. His shining shield was scored with runes to ward all wounds and harm from him. His bow was made of dragon horn, his arrows shorn of ebony. Of silver was his habergeon, his scabbard of chalcedony. His sword of steel was valiant, of adamant his helmet tall, an eagle plume upon his crest, upon his breast an emerald. Okay, so... You you hear it, right? You can hear the rhythm. Hear how dominated this poem is by the sound of the rhymes, right? Um, and this, I believe, is why the rhythm is so simple. Iambic tetrameter, very regular. Again, you'll notice how regular it is and how... Um, and how the breaks again are at the ends of the lines and all that stuff. He's not doing anything complicated with the rhythm of the lines themselves, right? In panoply of ancient kings and chained rings, he armored him. His shining shield was scored with runes to ward all wounds and harm from him, right? You see how regular that all is? Um, and there is a very good reason for this. It kind of reminds me of... Um, the comment that C.S. Lewis made about Alice and Alice in Wonderland, right? Because the Alice, Alice in Wonderland and, uh, and in Looking Glass World is surrounded by weird, crazy, wild, backwards things. Alice herself is a very simple, straightforward child, right? There's nothing like complex and interesting about her. Um, and as C.S. Lewis said, this is a very, this was a very, uh, uh, a very thoughtful choice by Lewis Carroll, right? Because if, if there were also like great, like emotional and psychological complexity to the character of Alice, it would be like one complexity too many, right? You need like a straight man and then the rest of the craziness happening around it. In a sense, I, I think it's Tolkien is making the same choice in his poetic structure. He keeps a very even rhythm that doesn't throw you off, that doesn't make you stumble, that doesn't uh, really bring things to your attention because it's the rhyme that does that, right? Did you hear, how, you know, after we pointed it out, you hear how, how strongly you can hear that? In fact, it's interesting to me, the, 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 the end rhymes are the ones that get kind of buried, right? Armored him, harm from him, uh, ebony of, of ebony, chalcedony, uh, 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 helmet tall, emerald, right? Those, to me, those are, uh, those are, they're, well, they're almost like afterthoughts, but they're, um, they're very, uh, it's, uh, afterthought isn't right at all. It's like the meat of the momentum of the poem are those internal rhymes because they're back to back. They're right next to each other, right? Um, so they really kind of, once you, once you're listening for it, they really obtrude themselves on your attention. And there's, but there's this kind of, um, there's this kind of satisfaction of the way the, the quatrains tie things up, right? In panoply of ancient kings in chained rings, he armored him. His shining shield was scored with runes to ward all wounds and harm from him armored him harm from him um the the driving force is ancient kings enchained rings scored with runes to ward all wounds and the whole thing is kind of embraced by armored him harm from him right just love that shape and how that works it's really amazing um and really reminds me of the predominant rhyme scheme 
that became really popular in American hip hop in the first half of the nineties. But never mind. I'll talk about that on another occasion. Um, anyway, it's, 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 it's really remarkable how that all, uh, how that all comes together. Notice how even the shape of it, um, uh, armored him and harm from him, right? Um, how those echo the two internal rhymes. We've got ancient kings in chained rings talking about not only the armor, but also implying the antiquity of his armor, right? And we know, we know even, of course, just from the testimony of Glowen at the dinner table, that ancient armor is good armor, right? Uh, that's the best kind of armor because people nowadays can't make armor like they made back in the old days. Um, so, um, so, oh, Brandon, Brandon, I have so much more hip hop, uh, 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 content than I had at Myth Moot. I was a newbie then. Uh, I've been, uh, I've been spending the entire time since Myth Moot listening to like two rap albums a day. Yeah. No, I, I've got so much content now, but that's a totally different story. Indeed, it probably a whole different podcast. But anyway, um, uh, yes, the ancient kings and chained rings is the description of the armor, right? The ancient armor. And then you've got, uh, uh, scored with runes to ward all wounds, right? So you've got the, not only the quality of the armor, but the magic that is laid upon the armor, thinking about that laid upon image that we got at the end of the last stanza, right? So again, armored him, harm from him, uh, corresponding to the chained rings, uh, and the scored with runes there. Um, yeah, his bow was made of dragon horn. Yeah, Veronica, I also don't know what kind of magical properties dragon horn must have, but that's got to be a good bow, right? You've got, I mean, bows made of horn, that's not unknown at all, right? Horn was a, uh, a material that sometimes bows were made from. Rarely from dragon horns, though, it's got to be, again, I don't know what exactly the qualities of a dragon horn bow would be, but it's got to be good. Um, His bow was made of dragon horn, his arrows shorn of ebony. Of silver was his haberdashon, his scabbard of chalcedony. Um, it is interesting, Matt, that we get his weapons in the first half there and the armor in the second half. Um, and of course, we get that pattern of, um, uh, we get that, pa that, that pattern of the thing and the, uh, uh, and the substance, right? The bow, dragon horn, arrows, ebony, habergeon, silver, though those are switched, right, in their sequence in the scabbard of chalcedony. Um, yeah. Um, that's, um, yeah, yeah. Um, we're still getting materials in the last quatrain. His sword of steel was valiant, of adamant, his helmet tall, an eagle plume upon his crest, upon his breast, an emerald. Um, yeah, you got to think somebody killed a dragon in order to get dragon horn, right? Um, so, yeah, there's got there's a story there too, right? Which we're not being told, um, but I agree that um, that certainly seems to be um, uh, that that certainly seems to be what. Um, is implied again. There's, there's, there's like an entire, an entire story, right? Um, uh, just kind of contained in the, um, in that one phrase, right? Dragonhorn there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, no, and Caligon isn't slain yet. We don't know. Um, whether, um, we don't know whether, uh, there were intervening dragons who might have been slain. Um, the brood of Glaurung, I mean, we, the brood, the brood of Glaurung does make an appearance, uh, at some point. So, you know, I don't know. But, um, but again, DMA, as you say, more textual ruins, right? Again, there's, there's, we're just hearing, um, you know, hints of the fact that, there's, um, uh, 
the, all these untold stories that lie behind, right? On the untold stories that lay behind the, 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 the place names in stanza one and that lie behind the dragon horn here, uh, in stanza two. Um, and yes, an eagle plume, spiritual cushions, a symbol of the elder king. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, Yeah, as far as the ambiguity of the crest, I'm assuming it means the crest of his helm, not on his crest like the symbol that might be on the chest of his armor or on his banners, um, like his family crest. I think it must mean the crest of his helm, um, especially since it's just talked about his helmet. Of adamant, his helmet tall, an eagle plume upon his crest. I assume that's what it means, especially since it's a feather. And that's where you would normally find a feather would be on the crest of the helmet. Um, but of course, uh, it, um, doesn't rule, because it's an eagle, it also doesn't rule out the fact that it could be involved, uh, in his crest in a more symbolic sense as well. Um, yeah. Oh, man. And I hear you. Those of you who are talking about how many vocabulary words you learned from this poem when you first read this uh, book uh, as a middle school or whatever. Absolutely. I will never forget being in a museum. I was in this museum and I was in one of those rooms, which I always found a little bit boring, um, which is like the rooms that have like lots of minerals in them right? Like displays of different kinds of rocks and things. was never super interested in that. No offense to geologists, was never super interested in those rooms. Uh, they didn't really appeal to my own particularly, particular like imaginative uh, kind of narratives that I really enjoyed. Um, uh, loved the, the like animal exhibits, loved the dinosaur exhibits, not so fond of the uh, rooms full of rocks. But I will never forget the time I was in one of those rooms full of rocks and I saw chalcedony uh, displayed. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh, it's Cal and I had no idea what chalcedony looked like at all. And, um, and so I was just like, and so I was just like staring and, you know, my, <laughs> my parents were like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like they knew I didn't like that room much. I'm just like staring and staring at the Chalcedony. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Cause it's a really neat looking thing. Chalcedony. Um, uh, it's white and it's very like ivory and it's, uh, it's very, it's, it's very intricate. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, it's, it was very cool. I was, uh, I was, I was very intrigued imagining, uh, A. Arendel's scabbard, which is, of course, the first thing I thought of when I saw the display. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Tora Marthen, I agree you would expect to probably see an entire bird on a on a on a crest design right the the single plume especially the word plume being used uh i think is really very likely to be uh the the crest of his helm um yeah yeah <laughs> meleowen says uh, or meleowen says a moment for all those who pronounce things wrong because formerly they had only read them in books yeah chalcedony is something that i uh, that i had to learn to uh to pronounce especially the opening part of that word i was I, I was pretty sure about the end part of the word because it rhymes with ebony um but uh so i was pretty sure it must end sedony um but i had um well, I say sedony. I wasn't sure if it was calcedony or like calcedony or calcedony or chalcedony or something like that. I, I, as a kid, I wasn't really sure about, but I was pretty sure about those last couple syllables uh, because uh, because of the rhyme. Um. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, the one that was there was not polished, JJ. It was uh, it was much more sort of intricate than that. But anyway, um, sorry, JJ was just posting pictures of Chalcedony. Polished Chalced Chalcedony, though. Um, anyway, uh, what else did I want to say about this? Lots of silver. We've been seeing that's been a theme, right? His, his, uh, Habergion is silver. Um, lots of silver involved with his ship as well. Uh, and upon his breast, 
is an emerald, right? Okay. Is it true silver? Yeah, not really sure about true silver. Uh, um, we're given no evidence of anything explicitly mithril related, though I certainly sympathize with people who are thinking about things like the, um, the sails of the ship, right? Which are woven of silver, which would seem rather unwieldy, but you know, maybe we're thinking about that. Um, I mean, if you think about it, um, uh, the, um, uh, if, if you think about it, there's very little reason to think that Mithril would be an, I mean, knowing, forgetting, not, not looking at it now from a first time reader's point of view, but knowing what we know about Middle Earth, uh, Mithril's only from Moria, right? It's only, uh, uh, from Khazad-dum, so pretty unlikely that A.R. Rendell would have had, would have had access to Mithril. That's awfully far removed. Hard to believe that they had too much traffic with the dwarves of Khazad-dum all the way out by the Bay of Balar. Um, so, yeah, and Bricktails, that's even apart from the historical side of things. Um, uh, the Mithril coat is described as this coat of silver steel in the first edition of The Hobbit. Um, so, yeah, Mithril is... It is pretty clear that Mithril is getting invented when they go to Moria. Um, but... Um, is Mithril also found in Numenor? I don't remember that. Maybe does it say something about that in the description of of Numenor? I don't know. Um, Mithril's found in Valinor. Well, I dislike it. <laughs> I dislike it. I know Tolkien was. Uh, inclined to put all these good things uh, in Valinor and Numenor and other places and stuff too. But yeah, Mad Violinist, here alone was found Moria silver or true silver is the sentence that I want to stick to. So uh, to uh, to imagine that, um, you know, Aule has his own private stash of, of Mithril seems a little bit anticlimactic, I guess. But at the same time, who am I to, who, who to grudge? Uh, Aule, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I mean, I think, um, that, yeah, east of the sea, it's the only, it's the only source of it. Yeah, I mean, it, was, oh, it almost certainly comes from Aule, right? No question. Um, so yeah, I mean, he probably have some. So it doesn't make it less special. It just makes it like, you know, Aule and Durin were like, okay, you know, this is, this is, um, you know, just for you, you know, this is our little secret, right? Um, but, um, anyway, that is to say, I'm not sure I see how it could have been, uh, Mithril that they were building with. Um, Somebody was making a comment on, um, oops, sorry, I keep shifting back there, about the emerald. Who's talking about the emerald? Um, uh, before we got onto the subject of Mithra, oh yeah, um, Fourth Dauntless and Ambrosius Aurelianus were talking about this. Fourth Dauntless, uh, right? Yes. For Thomas, one who first brought it up, who said the emerald doesn't rhyme as well as the other end rhymes. Is this a clue that Bilbo put it in at the last minute? Great observation. We will, of course, learn that that's the line that um, Aragorn helped with. Right. Um, uh, his helmet tall, his breast an emerald. I agree. There's It's... We got the M in helmet and the M in emerald. Uh, we've got, of course, the ald and the all in tall and emerald. Um, but it's much more slanty than most of those trisyllabic rhymes, especially the ones at the end of the lines there. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, did, is this because Bilbo just squeezed it in at the last second? Possibly so. Possibly so. Um, one more. 
Beneath the moon and under star he wandered far from northern strands, bewildered on enchanted ways beyond the days of mortal lands. From gnashing of the narrow ice where shadow lies on frozen hills, from nether heats and burning waste he turned in haste, and roving still on starless waters far astray, at last he came to night of naught, and past and never sight he saw of shining shore nor light he sought. The winds of wrath came driving him, and blindly in the foam he fled, from west to east and errandless, unheralded he homeward sped. Okay. Um, you heard the rhymes here, like last time, but do you notice what changed in this stanza? What happened? What sounded different about this stanza compared to the first two? Absolutely, Mad Violinist. The lines are much more mixed. Fourth Dauntless, exactly. More in Um, Notice how we we get... Just look, just look for punctuation in the middle of the line. We never saw that before in the first couple stanzas, right? Um, from gnashing of the narrow ice where shadow lies on frozen hills, from nether heats and burning waste he turned in haste, and roving still on starless waters far astray, at last he came to night of naught and passed, and never sight he saw of shining shore, nor light he sought. Um, there we have the, um, the, the units, right? The syntactical units do not match up with the lines anymore at all. Um, yeah, Mad Violinist, I, I try not to breathe throughout that part either. It's really hard, right? But it does definitely... Uh, come together more. Uh, I agree that uh, Night of Naught sounds really cool, Brandon. Um, <laughs> Timmy says the Night of Naught is right outside her house. Yeah, yeah. Uh, up uh, near, near, near Alaska is where uh, the Night of Naught is? I can believe it. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's start uh, from the beginning there. Beneath the moon and under star, he wandered far from northern strands. Bewildered on enchanted ways beyond the days of mortal lands. The first quatrain is very similar in style, right? We got two, um, two, like, sentences, right? Two, um, well, it's really one sentence. Uh, the second two, I guess it, there's one change, uh, thinking back to the, the very first four lines, right? Where we had, like, one independent clause in the first two lines and another independent clause in the second two lines. It has the same, uh, shape, the same rhythm there, right? Um, but it doesn't have the same syntax because the second one isn't an independent clause. Beneath the moon and under star, he wandered far from northern strands, bewildered on enchanted, enchanted ways beyond the days of mortal lands. It's just a participial phrase, a participial phrase and then a, a prepositional phrase, right? Um, all of it, in other words, just describe both, and both of them are adverbial. They're, they're all describing what's the verb? There's one verb in these first four lines. What's the verb? What is the verb that is the center of those first four lines? Wandered. Absolutely. That's the action. That's what's happening. Right? The first line, another adverbial. So the first line, lines one, three, and four are all adverbs. Right? Describing where, how, and where. Again, he's wandering. Beneath the moon and under star, bewildered on enchanted ways, beyond the days of mortal lands, he wandered far from northern strands. We get another adverbial phrase in that second line as well, right? Um, so he wandered far. So now we've got him wandering. So we've set it up. We had him. We had his ship. And we have his armor, which is very impressive, right? We have the arming of Arendel. Um He's clearly a big deal. Not just now. This is important, right? We didn't even mention this about the substance of the arming. This is very important because the first thing we're told about him is that he's a mariner, which doesn't necessarily tell us much. I mean, there are lots of uh, mariners who are pretty scruffy, right? I mean, like you don't have to be a king to be a mariner. In fact, it's a little unusual to be a king and to be a mariner. So, when we're first told that he was a mariner, what do we expect? He's a sailor. Of some kind, he's a ship captain. Is what is he a fisherman? Who knows, right? And then we look at his ship, and we're like, okay, fancy ship. Maybe not a shipper. Maybe not a fisherman. Maybe a rich fisherman, right? Um, 
But then, of course, he uh, we get in the second stanza, and we see of you know in, in panoply of ancient kings. Okay, not a fisherman, right? Or he's not a normal fisherman. Um, so he's we see the 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 richness, the exoticness, the um, uh, the heroic status that he has, right? Um, yeah. So now. We're, <laughs> yes, I agree that fishing in chain mail is not a good survival strategy. It does suggest, uh, something about his sailing too, right? Uh, uh, chain mail, not common gear for sailors to wear for very good reasons, as you imply. Um, uh, it suggests that where he's sailing, he is sailing off into dangerous adventures, places where he's likely to end up fighting, right? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, Luke. I, I doubt that Popeye the Sailor Man can claim any Numenorean uh, descent. He certainly doesn't look it. Anyway, no panoply of ancient kings. I don't think a, I don't think a tattoo shaped like an anchor counts, exactly. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, yeah, exactly. So if you... If you end up if you end up fighting monsters in the deep, you might be grateful for a suit of chainmail, right? Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Good. Um, so wondered, he's wondering um, beneath the moon and under star. He wandered far. In what other relationship with the moon would he wander? Or the stars, for that matter. Beneath the moon and under star. Now, of course, we get a little foreshadowing here, right? Uh, that will not always be his root, in fact. But, for now, that is his root, right? Um, but, um... But it certainly does tell us how far he wandered, right? The very first adverbial phrase that we're given to, to describe his wandering is beneath the moon and under star, right? That's where he wandered, namely everywhere, right? This guy went everywhere. This is what he did. Remember the tarrying back in the first stanza, right? He sometimes hung out here. Sometimes maybe stayed a little long, perhaps, right? Long enough to, I don't know, beget twin sons or something. But he spends most of his time wandering, right? And he has wandered all over the place, far from northern strands, which is apparently home base, I'm gathering, right? Must be where Arvernian is. See, I know more about Arvernian now. Bewildered on enchanted ways beyond the days of mortal lands. How far away did he go? Beyond the days of mortal lands. That's a strange direction to give. Beyond the days of mortal lands? Past time? Yeah, exactly. It sounds like the entering into fairy, right? Because we're told, of course, in the line before, that he's been bewildered on enchanted ways. So when we say this guy's been everywhere, he's been everywhere, right? Even to magical places even on enchanted ways that left him bewildered, where he has, like, left the normal timeline of mortal lands. Okay. Does it imply that he is not mortal, belongs Mon? Well, I mean, at least it opens the door for it. Do we know that he's immortal? Didn't say he was human. Right? We don't know. Right? We don't really have that information here. Um... Yeah, but JJ, I agree. It sounds like a description of movement in space. Like he wandered far beyond the, right, sounds like a movement in space thing. Um, and then uses a time unit to say how far he went, right? Um, and that mixture seems to me important, right? Um, again, an indication of how enchanted how unusual were the paths that he traveled keep in mind 
this I, this is not talking about his trip to Valinor. We're not there yet. This is still earlier on, right? This is still his first adventure, which is not working out, as we're going to see. So tell us more, Bilbo, about where he wandered. From gnashing of the narrow ice where shadow lies on frozen hills, from nether heats and burning waste he turned in haste, and roving still on starless waters far astray, at last he came to night of naught, and passed in never sight he saw of shining shore, nor light he sought. Whew! Eight lines. And those eight lines are all jammed together, right? Notice even the rhyme scheme. Let's just look at the rhyme scheme for a second. Frozen hills and roving still. Night of naught, nor light he sought. The rhyme scheme remains regular. In fact, those are really close trisyllable rhymes, right? At the, the end rhymes. But notice how, despite the fact that they're very close rhymes, notice how de- uh, how de-emphasized they are. You don't you really feel them. At least not in the same way. Again, those first four lines. Beneath the moon and under star, he wandered far from northern strands, bewildered on enchanted ways beyond the days of mortal lands. Hear how you land on northern strands and mortal lands? Because they're at the ends of phrases. Again, that kind of embraces and ties together the whole things, Right? Understar wandered far, enchanted ways beyond the days, northern strands, mortal lands, right? We don't get that same kind of embracing shape in the next two combined quatrains, right? Um, from gnashing of the narrow ice where shadow lies on frozen hills, from nether heats and burning waste he turned in haste, and roving still on starless waters far astray. See what he did there? And roving still is the fourth line, right? That's the end rhyme that's supposed to tie together with frozen hills and end the quatrain, like every other one has done so far. But it doesn't, because he separates it with the comma. The first time we are given a line break in the middle of the line, right? The very first time in the whole poem that happens, it cuts off the, the end rhyme. It separates it. Notice how that gives a different feeling to burning waste and turned in haste, right? That's an internal rhyme. But instead of being an internal rhyme that's being embraced by the end rhyme, it's kind of left on its own. Where shadow lies on frozen hills from nether heats and burning waste, he turned in haste. And roving still on starless waters far astray, right? So that the roving still, instead of being the end of the quatrain, sounds like the beginning, right? The launching into the next Quatrain. So it, it he, he, he manages to, at that moment, in the moment he puts that comma after turned in haste, right? He manages to break the fundamental rhythm, right? This poem has been proceeding in this orderly, very, the, by, by base, you know, very densely complicated, uh, sounds as far as the, the, the rhyme scheme, uh, goes, right? The sounds of the actual words, but the rhythm has been reliable has been smooth, has been even, and now it ceases to be. And it ceases to be right at the time that it's describing him being wandering and tossing around, right? We get this long eight-line group to not neatly tied up quatrains, um, where his adventure is all jumbling, you know, is all, his travels anyway, are all stumbling over each other. Right. Let's look at the internal rhymes. Narrow ice where shadow lies. Burning waste, he turned in haste. A really strong one because he ends, functionally ends the quatrain there. Um, uh, on starless waters far astray, at last he came. That's a really weak one. Far astray, at last he came. We get the, uh, we get the A sound. We get the ST sound. Um, so we get the, you know, came and astray. Uh, we get the, so it's really like, asked he came, 
far astray, but it's, it's, it's weaker than usual, right? And that again comes right after he's kind of lumped in the end rhyme into this grouping, right? Into this second quatrain. And then, uh, or at last he came to night of naught, and passed, and never sight he saw of shining shore, nor light he saw, sought. S sight he saw of shining shore is supposed to be another one of those internal rhymes, and that's another really weak one here. So, the rhyming sounds are kind of thinning out in this passage, this group of eight lines, right? The internal rhymes thin out, especially in the second, in the second half, in the second quatrain of these eight, right? Uh, and the end rhymes stay, night of naught, light he sought, as we said, are very close, right? Um, and we get an emphatic ending to the octet here, right? Of shining shore, nor light he sought. Ending with a period, ending with a really strong rhyme, right? And again, what's the content? What's the content of this line? Now, I know a bunch of you, a bunch of you are making jokes now, but a bunch of you um, have been wanting to talk about like the narrow ice and what that means. Please be patient with me and try to follow because this is really important. If you want to really savor the way Tolkien's poetry is put together, you got to do this, right? Don't just pay attention to the con don't pay attention to the content first. I'm doing this for a reason, right? Listen to the shape first. Let the shape guide you. First notice the directions that Tolkien is giving you through the sound of the words. What kind of a context is he providing by the way he structures the sounds? Then once you've noticed that, now bring to it the actual meanings of the words and what he's actually describing and talking about. And that will help you to see the ways in which he's interweaving these things together. Because once you start thinking about things like, is the narrow ice the Helcaraxa? Footnote, yes. Um, once you start thinking about that, you're, you're, you're losing it. You're losing sight of the rest of it. Or rather, you're shutting your ear off to the rest of it, right? First, listen with your ear. And then... Think it through. Because um, absolutely the form is as important as the content, especially in this poem, which is so intricate. From gnashing of the narrow ice where shadow lies on frozen hills, from nether heats and burning waste, we, he turned in haste, and roving still on starless waters far astray, at last he came to night of naught, and passed and never light he saw of shining shore, nor light he sought. Notice where that brings us. Again, the hard stop at the end of those eight lines, right? We've been on this journey. That is the, the rhythm of the lines, uh, the attenuation of those internal rhymes bring us, and they bring us to a point, right? If you're reading it aloud, you should be kind of out of breath by the time you get to the end. And where does it bring you? It brings you to nor light he sought. And notice, wait, he was seeking something? We've never been told that. That line is the reveal of the fact that he's not just wandering. He is wandering far, right? Beneath the moon and under star, he wandered far, bewildered, unenchanted ways beyond the days of mortal lands. But he wasn't just wandering. This is not just a rover. He's not only an adventurer. He's on a quest. He is seeking something. He is seeking light. He is seeking the shining shore. And he's failing to find it. Exactly. Exactly, Flamifer. Um, and that's not revealed until those last two lines. When we now begin to see retroactively the context, this is why. Look at, what, look at where he's gone. From the gnashing of the narrow ice in the far north, right? Yes, that is the Helcaraxa, but we've never heard of the Helcaraxa, so that doesn't mean anything to us yet, right? But anyway, that's surely far in the north, right? All the way down to the nether heats and burning waste, which is presumably much further south than the gnashing of the narrow ice, 
right? And I love the alliteration there, the gnashing of the narrow ice. Um, there's something especially cool, like when you alliterate on the N sound, but you alliterate with a GN, for some reason that makes it like at least 75% cooler than just an N alliteration, right? Um, but um, anyway, so from the gnashing of the narrow ice to the nether heats and burning waste. Um, where she, so the gnashing of the narrow ice where shadow lies on frozen hills. Oh man, I just love the imagery there, right? The north, uh, the, you know, the far north, which is this place that we notice north and south are not words that are used here, right? But what seems to be the far north, he's associating with, uh, with, with gnashing, right? Like the teeth of an animal, uh, like frustration, right? Um, and shadow lies on frozen hills. So the hills are frozen there, and it's not just cold, right? There's darkness there. There is maybe malice there. Um, and then in the nether heats and burning waste. We don't get much more imagery about that, but that's enough, right? He's turning away from both of these extremities, which apparently he's... Uh, uh, he's been to, right? Um, and roving still on starless waters far astray. Starless waters beyond the days of mortal lands, bewildered on enchanted ways. We've seen several indicators that he is going beyond what normal mortal mariners are capable of, right? No idea where starless waters are. But of course, I don't know how to go beyond the days of mortal lands either. Right. Um, maybe. Yeah, exactly. He's no longer beneath the, the moon and stars beneath the moon and under star seemed like a fairly generic opening. Right. Or at least to just kind of indicate that uh, he went really super far. Right. And the only way you can measure it is by is by beneath the moon and under star. And maybe we wouldn't expect uh, that he's going to go beyond that. And he's not going to be under the stars anymore, apparently. And he's come to the night of naught. Brandon, as you were pointing out, that is a fantastic phrase, right? But what the heck does it mean? I guess the night of naught is the starless skies, right? I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're going around under starless skies, you're, you there's naught in the sky, right? So at night you look up and what do you see? Naught, apparently. Does this mean he's actually gone away from the stars? Like outside of where the stars are? Or is it just that he's shadowed, right? Clouds and shadows, right? But the night of, well, came to night of naught. Sounds like a stable condition, not a, not a, not a, not a, not a passing meteorological phenomenon, right? Um, yeah, perpetual cloud cover, perhaps something like that, right? Um, now, notice this is the second time that we get a break in the middle of the line. And notice wh what he does with it. At last he came to night of naught and passed, and never sight he saw of shining shore, nor light he sought. And passed. Passed the night of naught. He went there and he went past it. He passed it. And then we get that last enjambment and never sight he saw of shining shore nor light he sought. Ending with the big rhyme on with night of naught. Um, and notice how now night of naught and light he sought, those rhymes which sound so strongly in our ears at the end of this careening crazy two quatrains jammed together, right? We get that contrast. The night of naught. Night of absolute darkness with no stars at all. Which, remember, at sea, really big deal. Because, you I mean, it's how you steer, right? Um, so if you're sailing in the night of naught, you're in a spot of bother as a mariner, right? Um, and he's seeking light. Not just in the normal way in which one would be seeking light, were one involved in a night of naught, but um, 
Uh, but it becomes a kind of irony, right? Um, he's seeking light and a shining shore, but all he's found so far is a night of naught. All he's found is dark and starless seas. I'm going to encourage you as we read this poem, try, for now at least, forget everything you know about the Silmarillion. Close your mental copy of the the Silmarillion and throw it away. Okay? Because we don't know that. This poem is not written for people who know the Silmarillion. This poem was not written by somebody who had finished the Silmarillion, right? Um, so, um, so forget it. Forget it. Forget the Silmarillion. We don't know it. Um, and again, I say that because if you're translating in your head, don't translate Night of Naught. I know some of you are wanting to do that. Some of you are, 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 are like, oh, this is like the shadowy seas or the, the, the islands of, yeah, forget it. <laughs> forget it. Don't translate. Cause as soon as you do that, you're not thinking about the night of naught anymore. You're not thinking about what the poem is actually saying and actually conveying to you, right? Take this poem, take this poem in a vacuum. Frodo is, right? Frodo is hearing this while he's still sort of floating in this disembodied way, um, with no, context at all right um yeah so um so yeah so forget about the silmarillion as the whole time we're discussing this poem and it's going to be hard forget about uh forget about the silmarillion um yeah it's uh it's tricky um last quatrain of this stanza so notice we've had four quatrains now in this stanza. And um, we've got the first one is regular, and then we've got those two which are all jammed together, and one last one. The winds of wrath came driving him, and blindly in the foam he fled from west to east, and errandless, unheralded, he homeward sped. Nice, neat quatrain at the end. We return to the regular... Um, we, we return to the regular form, right? In every way, both metrically, or, you know, both rhythmically, right? Um, four neat lines, no breaks in the middle anymore, no enjambment anymore. Um, and then also much more prominent internal rhymes again. Remember how the internal rhymes were getting all attenuated? Now they're not anymore. Um, driving him and blindly in, errandless, unheralded. I love that rhyme. That's what always been one of my favorites. Um, uh, it's, I think, one of my top three favorite internal rhymes in this whole poem. Um, from west to east and errandless, unheralded, he homeward sped. And what I love about it is the the way in which it's not exactly a rhyme. Right, we get the two. We get errandless, we get the three-syllable word, and unheralded, a four-syllable word, which is common, by the way. Notice how often we get an extra syllable before the trisyllable rhyme begins on the, on the, uh, like we get almost like a kind of a, a pivot syllable before we launch into the, uh, into the trisyllable rhyme and the internal rhyme. Anyway, um, but it's uh, errandless, unheralded. I love the, um, the, the shifting of the L and the D, uh, because th- to me, that's the most prominent sound in those words, errandless, unheralded, um, because you pronounce, it's, it's not a word like emerald, where you, you hear the L, but it's not really a, a very prominent LD, because it's not in the middle of the words at the end, right? So you kind of swallow it. Uh, whereas errandless, you hear the D and the L really clearly. And similarly with unheralded, you hear the L and the D really clearly, but they're flipped, right? Um, they are, um, uh, so the way in which it's a really close trisyllable rhyme, but with that sense of like reflection, which is kind of fun, especially because this is also when he's turning around and going home, 
right? So he went out, and so the moment, so the 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 fact that that internal rhyme echoes the moment when he's actually turning his ship around. I, I just, oh man, it's so cool! Isn't that cool? The way that he can play with these sounds and make the sounds to echo the content of the poem. I mean, that's good stuff, right there. The winds of wrath came driving him, and blindly in the foam he fled from west to east, and errandless, unheralded, he homeward sped. Um, he has not achieved his quest. And notice, this is not like for lack of trying, nor is it not, uh, you know, this is not like incompetence, right? He is rejected. He is being turned away. The winds of wrath came driving him. Right? It's not just like wrathful winds. These are just like, it's just, the wrath is not just a metaphor for the wind, right? Uh, the winds of wrath came driving him. It's, this is somebody's wrath has went. We don't know whose wrath, Simon. Exactly. Whose wrath could he be? I mean, he's looking for a shining shore and a light. That's literally all we know. We thought he was just wandering until we got to that point. So it's just been revealed that he was looking for anything. And now it's being revealed that he's being opposed. And he's being rejected. He's being, and, and again, the internal rhyme with driving him and blindly in. Right, he's driven away, but he is not going home under his own power. Right, he's not giving up, he's being sent back home. Right, he is being, uh, uh, he's being pushed away, he's being driven away blindly. Knight of Nought, remember, can't steer, nothing to steer by, and whoosh, the winds of wrath come, and blindly in the foam he fled from west to east, and errandless, unheralded. He homeward sped. He's got, <clears throat> he's got no errand, right? Uh, and he speeds home unheralded. Nobody tells them he's coming, right? He's not blowing any trumpets on the way home. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have the the really remarkable accomplishments of his wandering. Right. I mean, he goes places we can't even imagine, not just the night of naught. And, you know, but I mean, even just going from the gnashing ice to the nether heats, pretty big deal. Right. That's 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 pretty good. Um, but don't forget the enchanted ways beyond the days of mortal lands that we've already learned about at the very beginning. Right. And the whole context of this stuff, which I think, by the way, is probably maybe that's setting up the rest of it. So like the night of naught counts beyond the days of mortal lands. Um Certainly, if you're in a night of naught uh, where you can't see like the sun, moon or stars and you don't know about how time is passing, that could be considered in a sense beyond the days of mortal lands. I don't know. But um, but anyway, um, now he's heading home, whether he likes it or not, blindly driven, errand errandless and unheralded, um, uncelebrated defeat of his quest, which we still don't know exactly what it was for or why he was doing it. But we do know that there was a reason. Okay. I could go on like this for hours, but we are a full third of the way through the poem. So that's a pretty good accomplishment uh, for the evening here tonight. Uh, and we spent a lot of time at the beginning setting up the, um, the, the sort of shape and structure of the poem pretty confident we'll do like at least four stanzas next time it's absolutely going to happen um very good so uh, uh we'll we're, i'm going to end our text discussion here say goodbye to the folks on twitter thanks for joining us and feel free to join us for our field trip on uh twitch.tv slash signum you and there we go nope my touch screen is giving me troubles here Okay. Um, very good. Will we finish it in time for Halloween? Yeah, I think we will. I think we will. Finish the poem before Halloween? Yeah, definitely. All right. Okay, so uh, uh, Valori is not able to be here with us today. She is not well and has lost her voice unfortunately so until she finds that again uh we will uh be without her here um but 
There we go. You'll have to suffer with me filling in for There we go. Well, that's good. Retire. That's good. Um, let me just check and make sure I'm still good over here. Okay, good. Excellent. Um, all right, yes, I, I too hope she will not have to search as far as A. Arendel to find her voice again. Um, all right, so we are going to head off back to the Arid Luin. We're about to go explore those... We, 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 we looked at Gondaman last time. And we've got some more, uh, some more uh, uh, dwarf ruins to uh, examine. So let's go, let's go find some dwarf ruins. Clearly, dwarf ruins from a distance. And I was thinking, we need uh, we need some adjectives. We need we we need to make up some adjectives to describe the different historical layers in the archaeology of the Arid Luin region. So we need an adjective to describe the time period. Of when, um, uh, the the time period when Thorin's people were building things up again in the times after the destruction of Erebor, and before the uh, wait, where's my cursor? There it is. Uh, and before the um, uh, the restoration of the Lonely Mountain. So. We need to call that. We we. I, I decided we need an adjective for that period, like Precambrian or something. Something like that. Like that. Yeah. Devonian? So I mean, this, it's like the Thorin period, but we need a cooler adjective than that. It's like Thorinite, pre-Thorinite. The, the, the Thor, yeah, like the. Well, no, because it's not pre. It's it's the during Thorin's time. Because oh. there are. Are we going to Kellandum? Yes. Gondim. Because we can't go straight to Gondiman. So, Alas, no, we cannot. Yeah, we're going to start our real explorations on the road just to the north of Gondiman. Thorinian kit, I like that. The Thorinian period. Um, I'm tempted to put a G in just because Gs are funny. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that's okay. Yeah, we'll call it the 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 Thorinian period, and then we have the older period of dwarf history, where we see the the much older stones. So like the like uh, Heladul, the uh, the port city, right? That mm -hmm. was built up during the uh, during the Thorinian period, as we see. But we can also tell that some of it predates that, right? Um, yeah. So there's got to be three different, I'm thinking. <laughs> Sorry. Three different periods of dwarf construct of, of dwarf occupation here, right? Um, there's the older times when the ancient dwarf stuff was built. There's the more recent time when Thorin and his people came. And there's a time in between, right? Wasn't there a time in between? Now like an in interregnum? Something like that, I think. Because when Thorin came back, it's not like Thorin came back and, uh, like, kicked out all the other dwarves who lived here, right? I mean, they're... So it, it's... Remind me, and I need reminding of this, like, every week, but um, the, <laughs> the story of Skorgrim... Skorgrim, yeah, uh huh? Yeah. Um, dead dwarf king resurrected. Dead dwarf uh, king injected. Yeah, injected with a an evil spirit. Right, king of the dower hands. So, are we to understand that this area was a dower hand place for like ever? Is this the homeland of the dower hands originally? I don't think so, for sure. Are they? Um, there's definitely old statues of Skorgrim, and, you know, he was here hundreds of years ago. Um, when in, was his thing? The when was he, like, yeah, well, back when the elves were also involved up there in the north? Right. And if you, if you play through the uh, elven intro, yeah, yeah. Uh, you actually are there when Skorgrim dies. Right. Exactly. So and then flash forward however many hundreds of years. Right. Unlike the dwarven get... intro, which is 
as Thorin is heading off to the Shire. Right. Right. Um, yes. Yes. So, the older stonework that we're seeing... So what I'm trying to figure out is, do we have evidence, do we have reason to believe that the dwarves who lived here before Thorin and his people returned after the destruction of Erebor. Do we have reason to think that there were long beards here too? So it was 600 years, Amathorn? 600 years ago from now? So here we are now, like right at the end of the Third Age, and it was 600 years previous that Skorgrim did his thing, namely died mostly. Yeah, it's about 600 years uh, between the, the death of Skorgrim and current game time. Okay, okay. So 600 years. And after Skorgrim's death, so what are the... Right, he was defeated 600 years ago. Right, exactly. And killed. And that was before his inconvenient resurrection, which we witness is inconvenient resurrection, right? The resurrection of Skorgrim is a modern thing. Yes. Right. That actually happens like while we watch, as I recall, and mm -hmm. uh, is part of the plot of the Nazgul to stir up trouble around here. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Uh, the Nazgul via Ivar the Gaunt Lord. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, what is the... Man, you know, I don't remember Gondaman looking this impressive from the road. It's really impressive looking. But anyway, so what was up with the Dower Hands then during the 600 years between Skorgrim's death and Skorgrim's unholy resurrection? Do we know? What's the... I'm trying to remember. It's been so long since I've done the intro areas. I've done both the Elf and the Dwarf starter sets but i it's been so long um i remember there like there's that moment of betrayal when you're doing the dwarf one right mm -hmm. where like the dower hands turn on you but they do i do that a lot yeah but my question is i don't remember what was implied about before they did that well as far as i'm understanding i mean scorgrim has his tomb Okay, we're going to go up north from uh, here now. Well, Sorry. Yeah, in, Skorgrim's tomb. Up in Thorin's gate. Yeah. Yeah, Skorgrim's tomb is up where, you know, Thorin's gate is, through yeah. the intro area. So, for those 600 years, the Dowerhands must have lived there and guarded his tomb. Used it. It was basically their hall. Before I, There's actually uh, a mention. Uh, this is spoiler information for upcoming content, but... On the Bull Roar test server last week, we got to play through these Stout X Dwarves. And when you get sent, you're almost done with the intro and you get sent to current modern era time. You know, you get sent to, okay, now you're level five. You get to start and play the rest of the game content like everybody else. They mention Thorin's Hall as being the Dower Hall. Really? And boy, did it look different. Really? Okay, so then that does yeah. suggest that this was the place of the Dower Hands. Mm -hmm. And th so Thorin did come in as a kind of outsider, dwarvish, like colonialist, essentially, and yeah, take over mm -hmm, these. Pretty things. much. Yeah. Yeah. Um,. Yes, and so I, uh, I, uh, um, yes, Veronica, um, the, in the game, the Dower Hands are one of the seven tribes of the dwarves. Yes. yes. Yeah, the, the reason is the, uh, the game can't use the actual canonical names for any of the seven houses other than Durin's folk or the Longbeards because they weren't literally mentioned yes. in the text that Standing Stone has the rights to use. So the that's why they made race, up yes. their own dwarf race in the form of the Stout Axes and called them another clan, but they can't call them, say, the Firebeards or whatever. Right. Yes, exactly. The broad beams and the and the uh, uh, and the um, 
Wait, what was it? I, I'm totally blanking. You just said it. The the fire. Who I said fire beers. I could be wrong. I, I don't no, know. No, there, because the there is a fire. Names. Oh, what is it? It's the broad beams and the fire horns. No, it's not horns. What's the fire? I forget what the word fire is. something. We're talking about it in some film, but I, I'm I'm forgetting as I so often do. Um. Anyway, yeah. So they made these up. The dower hands they made up. Um. Uh. But um. Oh shoot. It's going to bother me now. It does involve fire. The <laughs> other, the other house, the house of no the dwarves of Nogrod, I think. But anyway, that's not even in the published Silmarillion. Of course, it's in it's in the the um, later volumes of the history of Middle Earth. Um, but okay, so then what we should ex fi it is Firebeards. Okay, Melio, and thank you, thank you. Yay! I got something right. There you go. Very good. <laughs> Um, so when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at the archaeological history of this region, then we're really primarily looking at two things or again, possibly three. That is, we have the ancient glory of the Dower Hands, like of which Scorgrim is like the culmination, Right. So like the Scorgrim years and before, when the Dower Hands were ruling here and living apparently near the elves, right? And then you have um, the later period after Thorin returns, uh, which is only a couple hundred years ago. And then you have that like 400 years in between the death of Scorgrim and the uh, uh, and the arrival of Thorin. Um mm -hmm. When the Dower Hands are still around, but they're no longer the same in the same position that they were in. Um, right. They didn't take before. a new king. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Which I always thought yes. was very strange, quite frankly. It's like, well, okay, their king died. It was tragic. Why wouldn't they have had a new king? Well, Why would they just wait around? Wasn't there a betrayal involved? Didn't he betray them? Ah, Pontine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pontine is always so good with the deed text. Thank you for that. So uh, the the Pontine says the deed text for the ruins that we're now in says the Blue Mountains are dotted with ruins dating back to the Elder Days when the ancestors of the Dower Hands ruled a vast kingdom ruined when Beleriand fell. Ringdale is one such ruin. Excellent. So yes, that's... No wonder they hate elves. Yeah, exactly. So they, well, right. Yeah, they probably blame them. Um, okay. So this was the ancestral home of the Dower Hands. Um, and they are now living, uh, so, but, but they've been for a while not really still living here, but not really ruling here anymore. Their realm was broken when, Sk when Skorgrim died. And didn't he, didn't he, um, Skorgrim, I mean, didn't he betray the elves? Before he died, I mean, yeah, when he was Morgrim, killed? uh was trying to take some relics from the elves, and Talagan Silvertongue gave his life to prevent Scorgrim from getting those relics. Right on. Right on. Okay. So that's why the Dower Hands have basically lost their kingdom, because once Scorgrim turned, they presumably even the elves were like, all right, that's it, right? You guys are out of business around here anymore. The Dower Hands are made into like a wandering people as a consequence. And then Thorin and company come in and they're like, hey, this place is great. And we've got all these Dwarvish ruins. Let's take it over. And the, the Dower Hands were like their servants, weren't they? Not so much servants. They were definitely not um, the kings anymore. They didn't have the power to basically kick the long beards out. So I guess it was like an uneasy sort of, I mean, they ruled, but they didn't rule the capital R. So yeah. um, well, and, they, they weren't I, servants of the long beards by any stretch. But I seem to remember some kind of betrayal plot in the dwarf opening sequence when the dower hands turn on them and, and that it was, that there was a, some kind of relationship between them which then is broken and the Dower Hands rebel. 
Well, the Dower Hands were the ones who were in charge when our players roll in um, to the Blue Mountains as either elf or dwarf. So basically, okay. the Longbeards are displacing the the locals, even though they're they're lessened. They they're still the ones in charge. Okay, Tormarthen says that. Tormarth- yeah. yeah, that's it. Thorin appoints a Dower Hand as his steward before he leaves. Right, right. Okay, trying to remember the plot there. Okay. But again, my primary interest here in trying to review all this is trying to make sure I'm having the accurate historical context Mm -hmm. in which to interpret these ruins. Because here's here's my issue. I'm beginning... This ruin is, is plaguing me with doubts and worries. That sounds worrisome. Doubts as to whether it's Longbeard construction or Dowerhand uh-huh. construction? Yeah, because mm-hmm. this looks exactly like everything we've seen and know the, the Longbeards to have built. Let me look down here in the valley because this looks really interesting too. So we've got this, we've got the little watchtower thing up on the hill. Not very, t- it's a very squat watchtower, but you know, dwarf. So, and we've got this little camp over here. So we've pitched tents. Next to perfectly good dwarvish ruins, which is kind of interesting. So these dower hands sort of keeping their distance over here. All right. Keeping an eye on Gondaman, though. I guess, yeah, doing that. But oh, what did that guy say? I spit on your grave, long beard. Whoa. That's a quest. Okay. So right. Oh, so that's a grave, huh? Mm-hmm. So that shield is a long beard thing. So if long beards are buried here, well, that makes me feel better. If Longbeards are buried here, then this is not just a dower hand ruin. Because, of course, my doubts and fears... Come, well, not fears, exactly. I'm not exactly afraid, but I am doubtful. Okay. And what I'm doubting is, again, if this is meant to be just a dower hand ruin, well, it looks just like we've seen. So maybe, like, this looks exactly like Gondaman. So maybe my doubt is, well, wait, does this mean that Gondaman was built by the dower hands? Um, Because it's exactly the same construction, but I don't think so. There's one thing that's unique about these ruins, and that's these doors. We've not seen these doors before. I don't remember these doors in Gondaman. Yeah, they're dwarven shaped with the the cut off the top corners, but they're definitely, the design is definitely unusual. Yeah, and they're, and they're shinier, right? They're a different material, and they're all, like, beat up and the do- like the wood on the doors itself looks more ancient mm-hmm. it does um and we've seen these doors in every single one of these i mean look there's like two of them over here two more of them over here it's really weird but okay because we have two options here right option number one this is a dower hand relic and the dower hands and, you know, in the dower hand period. So I will say, I will call, so I have my official names now. The early period, meaning Scorgrim and before, when the dower hands were ruling here, I will call that the dower hand period, right? Or like the dower hand golden age, right? In dower hand region. dynasty. Yes, that's the time, that's right. It's back in the dower hand dynasty uh, that I would rate, so that's much better. And then we've got the Thorinian period from when Thorin arrived. And the 400 years in between, we'll call the post Dowerhand period, but they're still here. So it's still the Dowerhand period, but it's after their rule, right? So, so again, the question is, where do these ruins date from? Do these date from the Dowerhand dynasty? Or do they date from the Thorinian period? Because if they date from the Dowerhand dynasty, then that suggests that, again, their construction is exactly the same. All of these, um, and they look very new, these ruins. I mean, like, look at, look at how sharp this stuff is. Contrasted, yeah. for instance, to the stone around the doorway there, right? I mean, this is barely aged at all. This looks barely more than 200 years old. Um, so, I'm still convinced that there's some sort of elvish techniques in play here. So, you know, the, the stained glass window effects. And there's just something about this always feels a little bit elvish to me. So, that's the other thing I'm looking at here. Okay. Maybe I'm, 
grasping at archaeological straws here, but the stained glass windows in the back, we didn't see any of that at Gondaman. In fact, that construction, notice the stone is a different color too. It's not this creamy mm -hmm. color. It's grayish, like grayish green. Notice the detail right. work. It's all, uh, you know, geometric and angular, like we expect of Dwarvish architecture, but it's, you know, the, the multiple layers and the, the, the intricacy of that work, it's nothing like what we see in these other structures here and in Gondaman or in Keladul for that matter. Yeah, I mean, there's filigree on, on the yes. stuff out here. Uh, why don't you go past the arch back out? Because you can see the stained glass better out here. Oh, you can from out here? Yeah, oh, right, right yeah, right there. Okay, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I was looking at the filigree on the, the, the tower on the right. Um, definitely, I would never accuse that of being dwarvish. Well, or at least... Not Longbeard, not the same. Here's my th here's 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 the potential theory. Here's the possible theory, though. What if this is what construction from the Dowerhand Dynasty looked like? Possibly, if you look at the stained glass, look at, at it really close. The top half of the stained glass doesn't kind of look like a guy with like uh, a sword in his hands at his waist and looking down on something. It looks like two arms and two feet. Like head. this, right? With his hand. Yeah. Down. Yeah. Then he's like looking down into something, like a pit or maybe. Or I, I mean, it's a little abstract, but I could kind of see that. But it's not. <sighs> we do get curves on the detail work on the topmost level there. Mm hmm. Curly cues, which is unusual for dwarves. But see, again, the dower hands could have a different sensibility. Artistic sensibility, I mean. See, exactly, Taweth. I am thinking that this construction right here and that construction right there, it does look like two different buildings. It's completely different stone or... Yes, I mean, yeah. Like, so, the actual materials are different. So here is my... Exactly, Pontine. The theory is the ruins with the stained glass is older than these other ruins. So I'm thinking that when the when when during the Thorinian period, when Thorin and Company arrived, I'm gonna carry on calling them Thorin and Company, even though that's not precisely correct, but it's a little bit funny, so I'm gonna keep saying it. Um, when Thorin and Company arrived, they built here, but they preserved some of the old structures. So you can still see it here sticking out to the side. In here, in the back. Right? They built these other edifices. I don't know how to explain the doors. Because the doors look imported. We don't see them doing doors like that. The doors don't fit with the with the architecture. Maybe there's something maybe there's something about um scavenge materials, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. They were the doors of the original um of the original and for some reason they kept maybe it was a symbolic reason they kept it. I mean doors and gates are sometimes symbolical. Um, so that, uh, that might be, that might be possible. Um, it is possible, Boomful, that it was a contractor error. You can't ever really totally ru uh, rule that, that out. But, um, but yeah, um, yeah. So I think, I think we're getting a glimpse in that grayish stone, uh, with the stained glass and, and the detail work and even the curly cues up at the top of what pure, classic dower hand architecture was like and all of this other stuff is later thorn stuff and it's one of the reasons that the dower hands who are standing around here are spitting on graves of long beards because they're really mad about what they did to this place right i mean this was one of the spots of the ancient you know dower hand house the ancient dower hand um uh, uh, you know, empire, and they just came and put all this, you know, long beard junk up. Maybe they tore down the doors because the whatever previous doors were long beard doors with like some hated enemy's face on them or something. So you think maybe the dower hands restored these, 
these uh, these maybe, old doors. Maybe they switched out doors. Maybe there was a symbol or an image of somebody they really disliked. Who the longbeards? The longbeard era doors. Maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah. Amethorn, you might say they'd be a little bit. It would make them a little bit more dour, wouldn't it? Um, I, I find it interesting though that presuming that the dark gray with the stained glass is pure dower hand construction and architecture how beautiful it is it the is dower beautiful. hands are portrayed i mean these these dudes need a bath right exactly and they yes is the not the nice guys the nice guys don't get to look good don't get to have the good architecture in tolkien in general terms so it's very unusual um, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by this theory that this is pure Dowerhan. Because I, you I, see, this gives us a glimpse into the ancient and lost and departed glory of the Dowerhands, right? Now they've they've clearly degenerated, right, into these club wielding, uh, filthy, you know, grumpy looking dwarves with tattoos on their arms. That's interesting. I see a lot of tattooing. On the dwarves got matching tattoos around your upper arms. What looks like copper holding your hair together there, right? Yeah, it looks like uh Look at the designs glass. on his boots though. Designs on his boots are kind of intricate. Elvish. A little bit. Kind of I'm like going back. But and they forth match the them. architecture. That's what I was looking at. Yeah, yeah. a little bit. A little bit. Some memories, yeah, they're patched tents. No, I mean, you're right. They're, they're depicted as like slovenly and walking right through the fire and standing in the midst of the fireplace and all kinds of unsavory behaviors uh, for the longbeards. But again, there's a sense of, you know, they have been diminished. They have fallen. They have declined. And I wonder... And they're you know, not happy about it. I don't necessarily disagree with you about elvish influence in the older architecture. But mightn't they have built that in partnership with elves back in the old days? I mean, they used to hang with the elves. Yeah, I mean, they used to cohabit this area with the elves. Yeah. So maybe the dower hands were best of buds with right. them. And right. maybe the source of their dislike of if the, the ancient uh, dower hand kingdom fell low because of the fall of Valerian and it came and news came from the West saying, Oh, Hey, it's the elf's fault. I think they'd be kind of upset at their friends. Right. Exactly. Which is why then they, instead of like the elves helping them or anything, um, you know, in their post, you know, in the post hour hand era, right. When they're, um, uh, and of course, then you know, scored their king, turned on the elves and everything. So now mm -hmm. they're enemies with their former friends, and they no longer. Yeah, no. I mean, I think you can begin to see the history, it's and then the interlopers sided. come, then the long beards come, and they build random arches, you know, over the path here for some reason. There's is there evidence that did there used to be a ooh? See this gray stone. This gray stone is the same color as the stone of the older structures. Mm -hmm. Actually, where we saw the, the better view of the stained glass there, um, the stonework led into native stone exactly. that looked more like the stonework. Exactly. So, you know, what the, you know what I'm thinking here? I'm thinking that there used to be a, an arch here, an old dower hand arch here coming mm -hmm. from that stone, like emerging from that stone and stretching across here. And the dower hands are like, yeah, no, the colors aren't good, and this is all shabby. Let's do this our way. And so they tear it down, and they you make the this... Longbeards. Uh, longbeards, yeah. And they make this nice, sort of clean... Um, uh, very plain. Dower hand. Though. Yeah, it's very plain. It is. You know, it's stark and clean lines and, uh, uh, and very nicely laid stone and everything, but... Um, you know, with the night and I, you know, that, 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 the goal, the, the blue vertical line, which is, uh, which is very nice, very characteristic of the, uh, of the Thurinian period. Um, it's lovely in its own way, but perhaps the it's other not, arch was even lovelier. It's elegant, but it's not beautiful. If, does that make any sense? Yes. Yes. Simplistic okay. elegance to it, but it doesn't 
actually say, oh, this is elven beautiful. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, Deathman has found more uh, text, uh, game text here. After the Longbeards routed them from the stronghold of Thorin's Hall. Aha, just as I thought. The Dourhand Dwarves scattered, maintaining only their hold upon the port of Keladul and several small encampments among the Blue Mountains. Like such as this might be one of them, perhaps. Many traveled beyond the arid Luin at the command of a white masquerading as their chief Skorgrim. While regathering their strength, they discovered the ruins of one of the ancient cities of their forebears, a long abandoned delving that they renamed Sarnur. Well, I can't wait to go to Sarnur, especially since I don't think I ever went there because I was soloing when I came through here with my characters and I couldn't solo in Sarnur. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm just looking at the shield, the cloven shield, presumably a long beard shield. Okay. All right. Okay, so yes. Interesting. And that entire construction, with the exception of the door, as we saw, might have been a, a long beard construction. Okay. Oh, boy, somebody just shot that dwarf in the back. Hard times continue for the dower hands. Um, he deserved it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So where are we going now? That was really interesting. Um, all right. Sarnur is right down there. Excellent. It's also a public dungeon. Some of us may not survive. Yeah. Um Uh, okay. Well, it's also getting very late, so I should stop soon. Let me just figure out where I want to go next. Because we didn't see any evidence of anything, just woods and stuff in through here. As we head off into the west, I'm not sure that we went this far. There's Gondaman down to the south. Gondaman on its hilltop. Right? That's what that is, isn't it? Or is that not? Uh, this is the treasure field. No, that's not Gondaman to the south. That's Gondaman to the south. Oh, ho. Okay, so we've got another thing over here. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at this then. Ooh, and we can see the ruins on the mountains. Oh, wait, is that the gate that we couldn't get up to because the path was blocked? The past, that's not like the pass to, uh, um, to the Havens, is it? No, that's not the Grey Havens. Okay. Is that Sarnor? Mm, I think Sarnor is a little bit further north. What are we looking at? No, actually, we're looking across as two... Well, there's two entrances to Sarnor. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at one of them. Okay. And that's Gondaman that we're seeing through the trees there, right? Yes, if you're looking almost due southeast, yeah, that's Gondaman. Okay. Oh, wait, no, right, that's Gondaman. Yeah, southeast. Yeah, huh. your mini map arrow should be pointing to it. Right, exactly. Whereas that is then something else. Yes, it is something over here. Okay. Well, we've got plenty to explore over here, but let's start up here next time. Another day, another ruin. So let's go up to this. And then we'll explore some of those other ruins down in that direction and see what we can find. Maybe we can get down towards Sarnur. And I know not everyone will be able to survive equally well in Sarnur. It's a difficult place, but okay. All right. More uncovering of the history of the dwarvish history of the Blue Mountains. Well, thank you guys for helping me with my history, with my in-game history. Yay! And, uh, well, next week we'll be on Landraval, so most of us true. will be on our mains. True. So we should be able to easily wander through Sarnor. Excellent. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll see what we can do next time. Okay. Very good. Thanks, everybody. And I will see you guys next week. Bye now. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.